serious. It's a very serious topic. Let me put on some quiet music so we can start. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. We thank you. You are alone, God. Bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God of heavens and earth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I might need this to look. No, I, don't, I think I have all my scriptures. We're good. All right, guys. We're going to start in the book of um, 2 Chronicles, chapter 18. So please go um, grab your Bible if you can. If you can't, that's all right. So we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, and the topic of today, yeah, um, you might need deliverance. I underscore nation, you need deliverance. Um, <laughs> I was not planning on praying on this live, but I'll pray. I'll pray on this live, okay? Don't worry, I'll pray on this live. And whatever is in there, I send the Father, the Holy Spirit, to start excavating it out in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Guys, let's learn about associations, okay? So 2 Chronicles chapter 18. And the story is about Jehoshaphat and Ahab. I'm going to give you the recap. So Jehoshaphat, um, I don't know if I should read the entire story for you. The entire chapter. So chapter 18, the entire chapter. I'm going to give you the entire um, paraphrase version. And then we're going to hit the high points because I have a lot to cover. And yeah, we'll do it that way. Okay, so Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah and Ahab is the king of Israel. So Solomon sinned. Solomon, um, the son of David, because God had told King David there will always be somebody on the throne forever. There will be always be somebody from your bloodline on the throne. Okay. But Solomon sinned and turned to other gods, Chemosh, Ashtoreth, and Molech. And his heart was turned because his wives, basically in his old age, deterred him away from God. Okay, So now he's worshipping other, other deities and God strips him of the kingdom and gives him only one, well one and a half. But it's in Judah. Judah and a part of Manasseh. So Solomon only handed over so Jeroboam is was the son of Solomon and Jeroboam only had control over Judah okay and um, Rehoboam no Rehoboam the son of Solomon had control over Judah and Jeroboam another man from another another family had control over the 11 tribes of Israel so Israel has had split okay 11 tribes one king, one tribe, Judah, one king. So fast forward, we are now in Second Chronicles. So the difference between sec, um, Kings, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles is that you are looking at it through the synapses, the lenses of the priests. So in the First and Second Kings, when you look and you read the stories, they repeat themselves in the Chronicles. Because the stories in the first and second kings are looked at through the lenses of the kings. Okay. But in Chronicles, you are looking at the stories through the lenses of the priests. Okay. So we read the same stories, but in this case, we're looking at it from the perspective of the priests. Okay. So here in Second Chronicles chapter 18, Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. And Ahab is the king of Israel. And let's go in. So I'm going to read the first, the first um, verse. It says, Jehoshaphat enjoyed great riches and high esteem. And he made an alliance with Ahab of Israel by having his son marry Ahab's daughter. That's important because the teaching today is about associations. Okay. The first verse says, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was God-pleasing. He followed the ways of the Lord. The king of Judah was following the ways of the Lord. Israel's king, Ahab, was not following the ways of the Lord. They, had, they were worshipping demons. They were worshipping other deities. Okay, But an alliance was formed between the king of uh, Israel and the king of Judah. Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Okay? And the way they established this alliance was they intermarried. They got, you know, 
Jehoshaphat's son married Ahab's daughter. Their family now. Okay, association. Now let's see what happened. Okay, now that we know we are, they're associated with each other, what happened next? A few years later, he went to Samaria to visit Ahab. So Jehoshaphat is the, the guy that fears God. Like he loves God. But a few years later, imagine him just sitting there in his palace and he's like, you know what? I need to go visit my friend, Ahab. But we know that Ahab worshipped other gods, demons, other deities. Okay? So a few years go by and he decides to go, uh, to go and um, hang out with his friend who has bad associations. Okay? As far as spiritually speaking. So Ahab is happy. He slaughtered animals for him. They have a banquet. So your friend comes over. Banquet's had sheep is slaughtered, goats are slaughtered, all kinds of things are done to uh, you know your friends coming over. And verse verse two still is pretty long, but it says Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to recover Ramoth Gilead. I'm gonna read that in the King James version. Also, so Ahab, the one that was worshiping demons, entices. Oh, Holy Spirit, you're so amazing. It literally flipped straight there. He is amazing, you guys. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay, so verse 2 in a different version, it says, And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to, Sam to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So my New Living Translation says he enticed him. King James Version says he persuaded him. And the reason I have two is because sometimes I have to cross-reference to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly. Because when you persuade someone, that means they don't want to do it. Right? So Jehoshaphat went to visit his friend and his friend was like, Hey, do you want to go to war with me? Do you want to go to war with me? This is after he had slaughtered all this sheep, all this oxen. <laughs> she said, I do the same thing. Do you want to go to war with me? Do you want to go together and we battle this person out? But you can't say no to a friend who just fed you, can you? You cannot say no to a person who just slaughtered an abundance of oxen, sheep, and goats. How do you say no to that? How do you say no to somebody who just slaughtered all these animals to feed you? Your bed is full, right? You're full. Just drank a bunch of wine, maybe. I don't know what you drank. And hi, Chase Miracles. Praise God. Welcome, welcome. And now you're saying, no, I can't go to war with you. You can't. He persuaded him is implying to us that Jehoshaphat did not want to go to war with Ahab. Exactly, <laughs> Jehoshaphat, Jehovah's skin. You're so, <laughs> you're so comical. But yes, yes, exactly. He is full, he is satisfied, and now his friend can persuade him. Hey, let's go to war with Ramoth Gilead. You can't say no to that. Any decent person could not be able to say no to that. I wouldn't be able to say no. I just ate all your food. I just ate all your food. How do I say no to this persuasion so we understand why he went because remember they have an alliance with each other Jehoshaphat's son married his daughter so they're family basically right and now he's fed you and now he's asking you, let's go to war and even though he worships demons and you worship the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob it's hard to say no to your association it's hard okay now, Jehoshaphat, now I'm going to start paraphrasing. Jehoshaphat was smart. And he says, you know what? Let's consult with God. And it's perfect because Proverbs 4, uh, 3, 6 tells us, Acknowledge me in all your ways and I will direct your path. So he's really a man that feared God, which is why it tells us he had great riches and high esteem. He feared God. He feared the Lord God Almighty. So he had high esteem and great riches. But still, that did not stop him from consulting God. He's like, let's consult with God first before we go to war. And 
Ahab, we already know who Ahab worships. He worshiped other gods. Ahab says, don't worry, I have 400 prophets. 400. What can go wrong with that? So the 400 prophets are called in to prophesy whether they should go to war or not. And he says, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should I hold back? They all replied, all, all of them said, go to war, you're going to win. But why? Remember, when we, on this platform, when we think about things, we don't look at the physical, we don't walk by flesh, we, walk, we don't walk by sight, but by the Spirit of God, okay? Everything that happens has a spiritual origin, and we understand that. So if we understand that things have a spiritual origin, we're going to have to look at why would all 400 prophets lie or say, yes, go. The king of, oh, so after all 400 prophets say, yes, go ahead. Jehoshaphat, the one who had a relationship with God, said, ah, uh, hold on a minute. Can we, do you not have a prophet of God? He says, is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should also ask the same question. So he goes, you know what? I respect your 400 prophets of Baal or whatever. I, I respect them. But do you not have a prophet of the Lord? There's a difference. Both prophesy. But which one is telling the truth? Which one is speaking from the mouth of God? And that's what Jehoshaphat was asking for. He's like, okay, I get that your 400 prophets said, yes, go to war. You will win, but let's consult with at least one that speaks from the mouth of God. Okay, and that is verse 6. And the king of Israel replies, There is one more man that could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. I hate that man. He can consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. And then he tells us why he hates him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is Micaiah, son of Imla. So the one man that speaks from the mouth of God, he can't stand him. Because he only prophesies bad for him. Why is he prophesying bad for you, Ahab? Oh, because maybe because you worship demons. That's why. Judge, he prophesies judgment. He prophesies conviction. He prophesies repent, repent, repent. So it makes sense that this one prophet who speaks from the mouth of God would only prophesy doom and gloom for that particular king. He only prophesies doom and gloom because you're living a sinful life. How can he say anything other than repent and come back to God? Okay? So that happens. So Micaiah, Jehoshaphat says, you know what? I follow God. So you need to get the prophet. Let's get the prophet. And you as a king should not speak like that. So he corrects him. They, they, they have an association, yes. But he says, you as a king should not speak like that. Let's get that prophet. Let's get him. I need to see him. Let's hear what he has to say. So Jehoshaphat was smart. He could feel, he had the conviction of something's going to go wrong. I should not go into this battle without consulting God. And why is everybody, because I have this uneasiness about this, because I'm not at peace with this, why are all 400 prophets saying, go, all is well, because destruction's coming. That's why. So he says, get me somebody that actually speaks from God, because I know you. And I know that you don't worship God. He didn't say that, but I'm telling you guys what thoughts may have been. That's what will be going through my head if I've been Jehoshaphat. I know you. I know your ways. Let's get somebody else who actually represents God. Okay? Micaiah comes. They go for Micaiah. So I'm in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 9. King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat, dressed in, the royal, in their royal robes, they send for Micaiah. The son of Imla, he comes. But before he even gets there, a messenger that went to get him, that went to fetch him, says, Hey, um, sir, just so you know, there's 400 prophets that prophesied good for the king. We know you, Micaiah. You only prophesy doom for this king. Please prophesy goodness for him. Prophesy and align yourself with the 400. 
Okay? So the messenger warns him. That's how twisted this thing was. It wasn't, what is the Lord telling you? It was, whatever they said, you say that. We don't care what God is saying. Whatever they said, say that. Okay? And what do you say? <laughs> Uh, let's see. So Micaiah replies to him and says, As surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what, the God, what God tells me to say. So he's a true man of God. He's like, I will only say what God tells me to say. When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to the king? Should we go to war with Warmoth Gilead? Or should we hold back? Like, what do you think? Like, what is, what is your prophecy, Micaiah? He does as, he, as the messenger told him. That's what he says. He says, sarcastically says, yes, go up and be victorious. Be victorious for you will have victory over them. Yeah, sure, go. Like, you guys are going to win it. Go ahead. Just, just go ahead. I'll tell you what you want to hear. Yes, go. But the king replies sharply to him and says, how many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak for the Lord? But he already said to Jehoshaphat, this man only speaks doom and gloom for me. He never speaks good for me. That's why I never call him. Yet here, he's backtracking and saying, how many times have I told you to speak the truth? How many times have I told you to speak the truth? When God tells the truth, speak the truth. Do you want the truth or no? Which one is it? Do you want the truth from the throne of God? Or do you want the lies? Which one is it? Because God's truth is going to make you become convicted. It's going to convict you. It's going to convict you. God's truth is not going to soothe you while you're actively sinning. His truth is going to convict you into repentance. That's the truth of God. It's going to piss you off because your flesh is like, how dare she say that about me? How dare he say that about me? How dare she say I can't sleep with, with this man that I'm not married to? I'm getting married to him next month anyways. It's a sin. Stop fornicating. It's a sin. There's no excuses in the spiritual realm. You're either doing it or you're not. You're either fornicating or you're not. Demons don't care why you're doing it. They just have a legal right to come in and torment you. Torment your marriage eventually when you become married. <laughs> Praise God. Okay? Not that voice, right? It just kind of comes out. I, I, I can't even help it, guys. I can't help it. So the king asked him sharply, how many times do I have to tell you to speak the truth to me? And then he tells him, Micah tells him, in a vision. So Micah has already had this vision. And in a vision, he saw the, the people assembled in heaven. Who are these people? God, I, I've already told you on these lives before, that in heaven, it's a courtroom. There's a courtroom. When the Bible says throughout Psalms, the courts of heaven, the courts of heaven, the courts of the Lord, it's talking about a courtroom. Okay? So they gathered in heaven. In a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, the master has been killed. Send them home in peace. That's the vision that he saw. Israel was scattered. And he tells that to the king. The king is like, I told you this man only says bad things about me. But he had just told you what you wanted to hear, and you got mad at him, and you spoke to him sharply. What do you want, the truth or the lies? Which one is it? Which one is it? He told you, you're going to go in, go ahead, and you're like, uh-uh. Tell me the truth. And he tells the truth that he saw in a vision, and you're like, I knew it. I told this man only speaks doom about me in my life. How would you say that the shepherd has been killed? Shepherd represents somebody who others follow. So a leader, a king, um, a pastor. Jesus Christ is our shepherd, according to Psalm 23. So we understand why he's perturbed. No one, no one wants to hear that they're going to die. No one wants to hear that, that, right? I get it. I get it. But you want the truth or the lies. Which one is it? Especially if you're living in sin. Married to Jezebel. Okay. Then Micaiah continues with his vision. And then he said, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him. On his right and on his left. 
So there's armies in heaven, right? He's the the Lord, the the armies of the Lord. Like he has armies up there, y'all. It's like hallelujah. So when you pray in your spiritual warfare, the armies come and assist you and help you. When you worship, they come to assist you and help you. Okay. So the the Lord is sitting on his throne, and around him are armies. Armies. All of everybody in that meeting was a spirit. Everybody in that meeting was a spirit. Why? He is having a vision. And the vision is taking place. The setting is in heaven, and the Lord is on His throne with an army of hosts around Him, and they're having a gathering. They're having a meeting. Okay, armies. Yes, hallelujah.、Um, and the Lord said, "So now, the, guys, it was a counseling meeting. Like, guys, the Lord is like, guys, who can entice King?" Ahab of Israel to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead, so he can be killed. Why is God asking this? Because in the spiritual realm, the time for him to die had already approached. His life on earth had been cut had been cut short, short already, and God is like, we need him to to die basically. So who is going to entice him to go to war? So his time is cut short. Who? And God is consulting other spirits. There were many suggestions. This is verse、um, verse nineteen, twenty says. And finally, a spirit approached the Lord and said, "I can do it." A spirit approached the Lord and said, "I can do it." Now, guys, if you're reading the Bible, if you're reading in your Bible right now, notice that this spirit has a small s, small s. Whenever it's a capitalized S, that is signifying the Holy Spirit. So this spirit is a bad spirit, but it was able to come and assemble with them, right? So the spirit says, "I can do it," and the Lord says, "How are you going to do it?" And the Lord and He says, "I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies." So. Where do the inspirations come from, guys? Like when your friend is inspired to go rob a bank, where is that inspiration coming from? A spirit. Inspiration comes from a spirit. Spirits. When I come on these lives, who's inspiring me? The Holy Spirit. Prim, jump on the live and teach about associations. When somebody's inspired to come against you, to abuse you, or to do something nasty to you, they're inspired by a spirit. Inspiration. Comes from spirits. Yes, we're walking this earth, going. Oh, that was my thought. I, I thought of that, writing that book. Oh, I thought about that. No, no, no. It was suggested to you, and you took upon it. Exactly. It was suggested to you, and you took upon it. Guys, I will answer questions after. Okay, I'm gonna answer questions after. So don't put any important questions in there right now. So the spirit, small s. Was a lying spirit. He tells the Lord, "I will go in there and inspire his prophets so they can lie." Remember, Ahab does not worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ahab has other deities, so his prophets were compromised. His prophets were compromised. They were dabbling in this, dabbling in that, dabbling in this, dabbling in that. The enemy can use people when there's com- compromisations. When God says, "Thou shalt have no other god beside me," yet your your ideologies are are your idol, you can easily be compromised. Okay, that's what the Bible says: bringing every thought captive, taking the thoughts captive, and bringing them under the submission of Christ Jesus. Because your thought. May not be aligning with the word of God. Okay. All right. So now we know where inspiration comes from. Inspiration comes from the spiritual realm. So it's it's in your best interest to know which spirit that was. Was it the spirit of God, or was it the spirit of the devil? Who is inspiring me to get together with this man? Who is inspiring me to go after this woman? Who is inspiring me for this? Is it for my well-being or destruction? Is it? 
inspiration comes from the higher, the spiritual realm. It's clear. The, 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 the Spirit said, I will inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. So who inspires you to speak lies? The enemy, the lying spirit inspires you. Oh, it's not that bad. It's just a white lie. White lie is like, it's not going to hurt anybody. Before you know it, that white light has like become like a snowball and you can't even keep up with it. Who's inspiring you? The lying spirit. It's right here. Okay. The Lord tells him, you will succeed. So God allowed that. He's like, okay, go ahead. Lie to them. Lie through them and you will succeed. And then 22 says, so you see the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of your prophets. For the Lord has pronounced your doom. The Lord has pronounced your doom. So where does like, oh, it was just so random. He was just walking down the street and he collapsed. Nothing is random in this earth. Nothing is random on this earth. Something happened. There's a doomsday. There's a date that was set in, in the spiritual realm. On this day, this person is going to leave this mortal body and the spirit is going to go back to where to like the creator for judgment. Nothing is random. Nothing is a coincidence. When you walk through this earth, guys, this world is spiritual. Things come from the spiritual realm and manifest physically. I remember one time we read a book, I think it was high school, about fates, like the fate of man. And it's not true. There's no such thing as like, oh, you can create your own fate. Oh, it's just fate. It's just fate. No, that's not true. It's not just fate. It's coming from the spiritual realm. That's why I'm really big on fight those bad dreams. It's not just a bad dream. It's literally your spiritual intelligence telling you by tomorrow you might be dead. You are basically getting a snap, like a synopsis, like a snapshot of what's coming to you. Okay? It's so important that we understand that, that this world is spiritual. The world we walk in, we coexist with spirits. You don't see them physically, but it's not mean that they do not exist. They exist absolutely, just like you see me, they absolutely 100% exist. The Bible is clear about that. The Bible is very clear about that. Okay? It's very clear. That's why I'm so big on what you confess. What are you saying about yourself? Don't just say anything. You don't know if that spirit is right there and like it's waiting for you. Like, go ahead and say. Go ahead and say you have, you have schizophrenia. Say it. Please say it. Schizo is right there waiting for you to say I have schizo. So I can jump right in. An agreement has been established. Association. Okay? So the Lord had already pronounced his doom. So now here we know that our day on earth, God knows our last day on earth. No man can take you out prior to God approving that. However, when somebody plans X, Y, and Z for you, and God shows you in a dream, you need to fight that because God is showing you so you can fight that because your days are not to be 35 and then you die. It's supposed to be 100. So God shows you so you have knowledge so you can fight it. Not so you can stop crying and just, okay, I'm just going to wait for this to happen tomorrow. No, ma'am, no, sir. Engage the spiritual realm. Cancel it in the name of Jesus. Especially if you're walking in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of Christians, a lot of Christ believers who have died early. Because they had no knowledge of how to fight in the spiritual realm. Or they didn't even want to do it. They're like, I, this is just too much. I, I, I can't. Whatever wars you do not finish or accomplish, your child has to fight that. What you don't overcome, your child is going to have to do that. So it's not a, a, a new thing where you're like, okay, she's just like her mother. Her mother was like that. Her aunties were like that. That's not... It's not weird. It's spiritual. So you need to you need to fight 
if it's, ne it's a, if it's a negative pattern, you need to fight it to prevent it from going down the bloodline. Because every time it goes to another generation, it gets stronger. It gets stronger, you guys. It gets amplified. It goes from, oh yeah, he was just his father used to rob banks. This man is trying to rob countries. It just amplifies. Because a demon got stronger and then jumped to the next generation. So it's not just you and fighting generational curse. It's not just you fighting for yourself. You're fighting for your bloodline and your child. If you don't like yourself that much, fight for your child at least, okay? Some people are like, oh, I don't care. I don't have to go up. I can just stay right here. Can you at least do it for your child? Please? Please. Most of our problems that we're going through now, trying to break out of, our parents were not able to break out of it. They didn't have the knowledge to do it, nor the, the tenacity. They're like, oh, this is just too much. The Bible says, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. It doesn't say through reading the Bible only. It doesn't say through knowing Jesus Christ only. It says, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. When you have the knowledge, you apply that knowledge, and then you go through deliverance and get yourself free. Because once you're free, your child is free. Your grandchild is free. Because now you have to teach your child, hey, don't do X, Y, and Z. It opens that door, that door, that door. So that way you keep your entire generation open and clean and for God. Exactly, yes. Okay? So Doomsday was, was announced for him according to uh, Second Chronicles 18.22, right? So we're going to, um, Zedekiah, <laughs> 23 says, Zedekiah, son of Canaan, walked up to Micaiah and said, how did the Lord pass me to talk to you? So there was jealousy there. One of the prophets, right? It was, it was 400 prophets. And one of the prophets goes up to Micaiah, slaps him and says, where did God pass me to talk to you about this? And how did God allow Alliance B to come into me? I'll tell you how. The fact that this man who's a prophet went and slept another prophet tells you the character that he had. Tells you from our last life that he had the spirit of anger in him. Does that help, guys? Does that help? The fact that the, one of the prophets, Zedekiah, prophets of Ahab, Ahab, went and slapped Micaiah for saying that God had put a lying spirit in 400 of them. They were compromising. The reason demons enter is because there's compromisation. Exactly, the heart posture. So he went and slapped this prophet, the true prophet of God, slapped him. And said, how did God escape me to talk to you? That literally tells you that he had anger issues. That's not a character of God. And that is not a character of God. Galatians 5 is clear. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? I was like, oh, he slapped them. It was jealousy. Like, how did God leave me and come to you? Jealousy, envy, and anger. And we know that anger, if you don't take care of the anger that comes and boils up, you don't take care of it before sunset. The devil will use that as a foothold to come in. So I can actually conclude right here that Zedekiah, the son of Canaan, was angry, and that's how, was an angry angry prophet, angry man, and that's how the spirit of lying could come into him. He may have been one that actually listened to God, but because he has, he has such an outburst, it tells you that he had a spirit of anger in him. And so that opened up the door for other spirits to come in. That's how it works. When you have one spirit, they don't come by themselves. They come with their best friends. Anger walks with rage. Fear walks with worry. They work in pairs or groups. Okay? 
Exactly. No self-control. But that tells you why a lying spirit could come into him. Because the Bible says, do not get easily angered because you give the devil a foothold. Anger is an open door for the enemy to use you to hurt other people, to harm other people. Okay, so then Micaiah replies that, you know, you know, guys, read the entire chapter. But I'm going to skip over to verse um, 28. So now, guys, association is so deep. So now Micaiah has told them the true thing that came from the mouth of God. Jehoshaphat knows the outcome of that war, that the king will be killed. But he still goes. He still goes with Ahab out to war against Ramoth Gilead. He still goes. He feels he, he feels like obliged to go. Right? Even though he heard from the mouth of God that this is going to be disaster, he still goes. So, the king of Israel says to Jehoshaphat, he's trying to like figure out how to maneuver, manipulate his way out of death, right? As we go into battle, I will disguise myself so no one will no one will recognize me. But you will, you wear your royal robes. Like you go ahead and wear your royal robes. I'm going to disguise myself like a peasant or whatever, and no one will know it's me. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to war. They went to battle, guys. We're gonna skip to oh yeah, let's do 32. So 30, it talks about what the king of Aram said. The king of Aram said. He issued these orders to his chariot commanders. Attack only the king of Israel. Don't bother with anyone else. Their goal was to kill. Listen. Listen to me guys very carefully. When the day, when the spiritual realm, when God is against you, everything else is going to be against you. God I already said, I have, his, I have pronounced his doomsday. God has said he's going to die on this day. So it's, it's not a surprise, right? The spiritual realm has already declared that he's going to die that day. So everything around him is going to go crazy to ensure that that comes to pass. So the king of Aram had told everybody, attack only the king of Israel. Don't bother with anyone else. Don't go shooting up these other people. Leave the other churches alone. Leave the churches alone. Just look for the king of Israel. Look for the king of Israel. That's it. Your assignment is to find the king and kill him. That's it. Why? It was established in the spiritual realm. His day of death had been established in the spiritual realm. So if... Let's say he had escaped that battle and he wasn't killed. I promise you guys if he just walked... Past the cliff, would have fallen over the cliff. The wind would have come over and swept him off the cliff. The day of judgment for him had come. And that's how the spiritual realm works. You can't outsmart the spiritual realm. Especially if it's your judgment day. Okay? So, 31. So, Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 31 says, So, when the Aramean chariot commanders... So Jehoshaphat, remember Jehoshaphat went in looking like a king, but Ahab is disguising himself. He went incognito. They went after Jehoshaphat. They're like, oh, there's a king. Let's go after him. They're going after him, right? But Jehoshaphat called out. He called out. To who? To who, guys? God. Jehoshaphat was like, Lord, help me. Help. And what happened next? What happened next? Oh, this is so beautiful, guys. Call on me and I'll answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things you don't know. All right. So he calls out and the Lord saved him. God helped him by turning the attackers away from him. It wasn't his day to die, you guys. It was not Jehoshaphat's day to die. So when he called out to God, God made the attackers just angels were sent to like, hey, get away from this man. That's how it works. The spiritual realm says you're supposed to stay alive and you call out to God, help me. They're going to ensure you stay alive. I don't care who's attacking you. 
as soon as the chariot commanders realized he was not the king of Israel, they stopped chasing him. Yes, he was dressed up like the king, like the king he was for Judah. But once they realized, okay, that's not who we need. That's The spiritual realm is like, yo, that's not the man you need. That is not the man we're trying to kill today. Oh, okay, well, let's find the man we have to, like, who else is wearing a robe? Like, who else looks like a king here? Okay. Now, listen to this, guys. When the spiritual realm is, when, when, when the spiritual realm is against you, when you have upset God, everything is going to fight you. Everything. How did he die? How did Ahab die? Remember, he's disguising himself. He went incognito. But how did he die? An Aramean soldier, however, randomly shot an arrow. Random. Like, bloo. He may have been doing target practice. Ta Yo, target practice. Like, next thing we know, that arrow was going south. It turns into north and hits Ahab. And that's how it works. When God has decided something's going to happen, all elements are going to work to make sure that it happens. The wind will switch up. Everything's just going to go crazy until it happens. Somebody felt inspired to randomly shoot an arrow. Randomly. That's not the way soldiers work. Soldiers just go doing, like, they have strategies. They're calculated. They're calculated and they, they have strategies that they have to follow. But this man randomly shoots an arrow. And this arrow somehow finds Ahab between the joints of his makeup stuff. So he had like, um, I guess he had uh, armor? Let's see. Yeah, he had an armor on. He was covered. But this arrow not only found Ahab, it found him between his, uh, so he probably like shot him between like the, they had the breastplate and maybe something over here. He literally found him like right here and just shot him. This arrow randomly shot, found him and hit him between the armor. Is that random? No. The spiritual room was set to make sure that Ahab dies that day. And that's how God's things work. His day was up. He refused to repent. He refused to turn away from his evil ways with his Jezebel, with his wife Jezebel. Thank you, Sue. So that's what happened. Literally, that's why I'm telling you guys, things don't randomly happen. People are like, oh, he was walking under a bridge and the bridge fell on his head. That's not random. The day was decided that this day, this person has to leave. So the bridge just so happened to be the medium of him leaving this earth. With of him, like his spirit leaving the mortal body. Because it was set in stone in heaven on this day, he is leaving on he's leaving this earth. Exactly. Like, oops, I killed the king. This man went incognito. Exactly. His time has come. And that's how it works. In the spiritual realm, when the time is up, the time is up. Whether you want to like outmaneuver the spiritual realm, manipulate it, go incognito, try this, try that, it's going to happen. Someone's going to randomly be inspired to do something crazy, drive the car off the bridge, and you are the person under the bridge. Oh my gosh, what happened? Oh, I didn't mean it. I just felt like I needed to drive my car off the bridge. I made it. I'm still alive, but this person's gone. It was orchestrated in the spiritual realm. It was orchestrated in the spiritual realm. And that's how that works, guys. And that's how that works. So then, yeah, he died that day. So uh, verse 34 says, The battle raged all day that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Arameans. Arameans, Arameans, yeah, that's how you say it. In the evening, just as the sun was setting, he died. He died at sunset, guys. All that to tell you that associations matter. Jehoshaphat could have died that day. Jehoshaphat could have died that day. 
because he was in the wrong crowd. He was hanging out with a person that could care less about God. They were coming for him, coming to kill him. And I don't know if you guys noticed this. The king, King Ahab literally says, you dress up as king and I'm going to dress up incognito. He was setting him up. Is that a setup or not? I'm seeing it as a setup. Amen. Don't drive cars off the bridge, guys. Please don't. It was a setup, guys. He set him up. It was a setup. Ahab set up Jehoshaphat and said, if this guy goes out there wearing these robes, he will die. He set him up. But it was his friend. They had an alliance. This the, the, the son, the son was married to the daughter. It was beautiful. Nya, 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 nya. He set him up. But that the person he set up had God. He had God. He called out to God and God saved him. Call unto me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things you don't know. How do you tell your friend, hey, we're going to battle. Come with me. Persuade you to come with me. You come with me. All the prophets say, or the lying prophets say, you're going to win. The true prophet says, you're going to be killed. But now I'm telling you, dress up like a king. I'm going to dress up like a person, a peasant or whatever. Let's go to war. He set him up to get killed, to get Jehoshaphat killed instead of him. Ha! He manipulated, guys. He was trying to manipulate the spiritual realm. But you can't do that. He was trying to manipulate the spiritual realm to get his friend friend killed. Exactly. A child of God just has to call out. But guys, you have to call out. The heavens are open over you, but you have to call out. You can't just silently sit and start sobbing. <laughs> Everything's going crazy. Nah, y'all. Like, actually, call unto God. Angels are activated when you call unto God. Psalms 103, verse 20. Okay? Amen. That's how he shows himself. But I just now, literally right now, Holy Spirit just gave me the revelation that Ahab set up Jehoshaphat. I just got that right now. Like, hold on a minute. He told him, you dress up like a king. I'm going to go out looking like this. They won't know who I am. Anyways, guys, I wrote down some things that we're going to go over. Uh, if you're interested, please read that story again. Second Chronicles chapter 18, the entire story. And you're going to understand associations and that sometimes your associations just want you dead. Especially when you don't have the heart of God. That's why it's so important that we are equally yoked. Equally yoked means in a marriage and in friendships. Oh, praise God. Thank you. And in friendships, because they can get you killed. They can absolutely get you killed. Okay. So, mm, okay. I'm going to talk about Jonah real quick. So Jonah, if you haven't read Jonah, guys, read that story. It's really short. I think it would take about two hours max. So Jonah was running away from God, right? He was running away from God. And the people on the boat suffered because of Jonah. That was an association. He went on the boat to be able to get to Tarshish. And they were like, the storm came. The storm came. And they were like, what's going on? And they all started to worship their own gods. Praise their own gods. Trying to appease their own gods. And nothing was happening. And But Jonah was sound asleep. Why? Because he knew, like, you know what? I just rejected what God told me to do. I'm just going to go ahead and hang out. If it's a storm... That's probably my God acting up. That's fine. I'm going to go to sleep. So he went to sleep, right? And then wake him up like, yo, hey, can you pray to your God? Maybe your God listens. He's like, oh, you know what? You are in this situation because of my God. Yeah, guys, I am so sorry. The reason this whole thing is being up, like turning upside down and crazy is because of me. My God is doing this. And they're like, what? It's like, yes, I'm running away from God, guys. <laughs> yes, so you know, I'm running away. So God is acting up. Uh, it's my fault. Associations. Close proximity. These men are like, oh my gosh. 
let's try to save you. Your God wants you dead. That's fine. Let's try to save you. So they throw all these cargo things overboard. They throw this and this and this overboard. But nothing was working. So from that story, they lost resources. Resources because of their association to Jonah. Him just being on the boat was enough for them to lose resources and financial stuff because he was running away from God. It really does. Associations. They can kill you or they can break you or make you. Associations. Make you bankrupt or add value to you. Associations. But towards the end of the story, guys, um, once they once he told them, guys, if you throw me overboard, um, God will calm the storm. I promise you, throw me over. God's going to calm the storm. It's my fault. Once they did that and the, the storm immediately went still, these men realized, like, oh, my gosh, he really is the true living God. So there was a conversion. There was a transformation of heart. So they, they sacrificed to God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there was, a, there was good in it, right? They got saved. But I wanted to, I wanted to like show you that there's associations in that story as well. Okay? And that the associations, let's say you are around people who are non-believers, like unbelievers. The only thing that's going to cause them to bring the heart into repentance is the power of God. When something crazy happens and you pray and you say, I'm calling to my God, he's going to show up. He's not a liar. He's not a man to lie. That's what's going to transform their hearts to come to Jesus. Okay? <laughs> Basically, he cost them money. They threw all this stuff overboard to save him. And he's like, God, it's not going to work. God won't give up. God's will be done. He won't give up because he wanted to save 200,000 people from the Neve. But Jonah's like, I don't care about them. I want them to die. And that's, if you ever wondered how God's heart is and how human heart is, that is, that is a contrast. That is a perfect way you understand God's heart and human hearts. Jonah's story. Praise God. His story shows you that God cares so much about people not going to hell. He cares so much about people not perishing. But Jonah was so so enthralled, so engrossed in a plant that he didn't even create nothing. Had nothing to do with the plant, but he wants the plant to live, but not the people. That's the difference between God's heart and people's heart. Before you are, before you are transformed by God and he creates a new heart within you, and gives you renews the right spirit within you. Whew. You don't care about people. You don't care about people. You're like, I don't care what's happening. And that's why God says, Come to me. I will change you. I will transform your heart. I will do it. Rely on me. I'll do it. So in Jonah, they lost resources because of him. Okay. Um, let's see. So again, I told you about the story, the unbeliever, no, the believer. And this is the other thing, guys. I wonder if Ahab did some kind of spell to get Jehoshaphat to come visit him. Because Jehoshaphat was minding his business in all his riches and glory. Believing God, loving God. And then one day he decides, you know what? Let me go visit my friend Ahab, who's a non-believer, whose wife is a witch, Jezebel. And then he just up one day decides to go visit him. Animals are slaughtered. Goats are slaughtered. This is slaughtered. A buffet is had. A feast is had. And then he persuades him. What pulled? What pulled Jehoshaphat? What inspired him to go visit? What inspired him? He didn't come because it was lack. What inspired him? <laughs> Praise God. Um, I don't know what you're referring to about kissing the hand or the cheek. But praise God. But listen, guys. What inspired Jehoshaphat to go visit Ahab, the unbeliever? Right? Jehoshaphat served God. 
what went into his mind one day where he was like, you know what? I need to visit my friend who's an unbeliever. Let's party together. Yeah, it was a setup all along, you guys. And that's why I want you to read the Bible like that. Read the Bible asking yourself these questions and Holy Spirit will give you the revelations that come with that. Just up one day decide to go visit this person. Years passed. Years passed after the alliance was established. And then he's like, let's go visit my friend. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God. And it's good for correcting, rebuking, um, edifying, and there's one more, in righteousness. So what I want you guys to understand here on this live today is that inspiration, inspiration comes from somewhere. And there's only two powers. That's it. One is board power, right? The devil, this power that people have given the devil. And so he has some power because people have literally given him dominion you know, to be used by him. And then we have God's power, all powerful, all power is given to God, all power is given to Jesus Christ in heaven, on earth, under the earth, everywhere. Okay. So when inspiration only comes from two places, you ask yourself when something is happening, who is inspiring this conversation right now? She's cussing me out. Who's inspiring this? The devil. Who's inspiring me to write this book? And all I have in this book is demonic stuff. The devil. Who's inspired me to sing this song? And the entire, all the lyrics are just demonic stuff. The devil. Inspiration comes from two, two places. That's it. Inspiration comes from two places. Praise God. Good to see you, girl. Two places. Inspiration comes from two places. Okay? It's important that we understand that. That when you're just sitting there going, hmm... I wonder, I wonder what she thinks about me. Oh, that, oh, I can't stand her. Where you, what, for what, why? She does not pay your bills. She, she doesn't even know you. Half the time she doesn't even know that you even are there. So these things are coming from somewhere, a spirit being. So before you act in your flesh, ask yourself, who is inspiring this? Who is inspiring this? Two systems, God's system and the demonic system. That's it. Only two systems. Only two systems. Don't let anybody else lie to you. Only two systems. Okay? Inspiration. Thank you, Sue. Inspiration comes from somewhere. We have to know that. We have to. That's what helps me walk in the spirit. If my mother calls me and she's about to start gossiping, I'm like, Mom, I am fasting right now. This is not inspired by God. I know it. And she, I thank God that she's a Christ believer. She understands and she's just laughing and hangs up. She's like, you're right. It is not inspired by God. And you're fasting. Goodbye, girl. Goodbye. And that's it. Because we're not supposed to gossip. We aren't. We aren't. You know? Hello, Rizan. You just joined. Um, welcome. The topic is associations. It's important to know that associations matter in this spiritual realm because God tells us not to be unequally yoked. Now that verse is primarily talking about marriage, which is one of the biggest decisions you can ever make. The biggest decision you can ever make is your partner in life, okay? That can destroy your life or make your life, okay? That's one. The second thing I want to say is that God revealed to me that equally yoked also implies to friendships. I have been unequally yoked with people whose families were in witchcraft. I've had to fight battles. So I'll tell you right now, do not just go joining people just because you're feeling lonely. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring the right people to you. And so we, the, the story we talked about, praise God, the story we talked about was 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a man of God. He followed God. Ahab was not a man of God. His wife was Jezebel. And everybody knows who the Jezebelic spirit is. Manipulation, control, witchcraft. High level witchcraft. Marine kingdom spirits. Okay? So, Jehoshaphat 
made an alliance with Ahab by getting his son to marry Ahab's daughter. So they became family. And then one day, Jehoshaphat just up and decided, oh, you know what? I need to go visit my unbelieving friend. Just one day. Just out of nowhere. But we know on this platform that nothing just happens for no reason. It is inspired by somebody, the devil or God. Okay? So Jehoshaphat, following the laws of the Lord, he was rich, great riches and great high esteem, did not need to go visit Ahab. He had no need for anything, right? He was not in need for anything. But one day, out of nowhere, years have passed, he says, let me go visit my friend. He goes to visit his friend, Ahab. Ahab slaughters oxen, sheep, whatever. He slaughters a huge feast is had. And after Jehoshaphat is full, Ahab says, hey, buddy, do you want to go to war with me? And, a and Jehoshaphat's like, well, uh, uh, he's uncomfortable. He knows something is up. He is not at peace with it. So he says, we should probably consult the prophets. Before that, the Bible literally says in the Living, New Living Translation that Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat. Enticed. Now, I also took my Bible, the King James Version, and there it says, he persuaded Jehoshaphat. Both words are very strong. Both those words are strong. To entice someone is huge. To persuade someone is huge. So it's important for us to understand that. It was not Jehoshaphat going, you know what, I came to visit you so we can go to war together. No, he was persuaded, he was enticed. Meaning something else was, had been done out there in the spiritual realm. Jezebel had probably done something to get Jehoshaphat to come there and then get Jehoshaphat to say yes to all this madness. It was not his battle to go to. It was not his battle. So he gets fed. Remember I told you eating is covenant. Don't eat people's food. Do not just sit there and start eating because it might have other intentions. He's eating all this food and now they're like, yes, we have reestablished our covenant. Yeah. Do you want to go to war? How do you say no to somebody when you're full with their food? How? You guys tell me. How do you say no to that? How do you say no to someone? You just ate all their food. Sheep, goats, oxen. You can't. You can't possibly say no to this person. Right? But Jehoshaphat feels uneasy about this. This, this is like the spirit of God, like, hey, you should not be here. You should not be here. So he says, you know what? I can go to war with you, but let's consult with God. Do you have any prophets? Do you have anyone that speaks to God? Ahab brings 400. I'm doing four, I'm doing four here, but it's 400. 400 prophets come and prophesy that he's going to win this war. Go ahead and do it. Okay? But then Jehoshaphat is not at peace. He knows something is up. He can already tell something is up. So he says, do you not have a person that speaks from God that tells us that these 400 prophets were compromised? Which is why I tell you guys, when you hear words from a prophet, when you get prophesied to, filter that through the word of God. Go to God for him to confirm the words. Because God's, this is the one thing that will never pass away. Okay, this is never going to pass away. Okay, this is our foundation. It is our foundation. It is our foundation. This is our foundation. I'm going to, I'm going to say this every day whenever I'm on the live. This is your foundation, no matter what. Okay. So in this case, Jehoshaphat was using the scripture found in Proverbs 3, 6, which says, Acknowledge me in all your ways and I will direct your path. <laughs> God did that for him. He did. He did that. Um, Micaiah comes and tells them, you know, I saw Israel scattered with no shepherd. Shepherd is symbolic of a leader. So basically he's saying that the king is going to die in this, in this war. And the king says, oh, why would you do this? Why would you prophesy doom and gloom for me? I knew it. I knew it. So, um, they've consulted God, but Jehoshaphat still could not say no. 
the fact that he went along with it, even though he heard the prophecy and that God had put a lying spirit in 400 prophets, 400 prophets, that tells you that it was under manipulation to go. Jezebel would manipulate Jehoshaphat to go to war with her husband. That's what Ahab wanted. Okay? So there's a little spiritual activity happening here that if you just read the story just for the face value of it, you won't understand it. But if you actually look at how Jehoshaphat was responding, like, okay, let's talk to somebody else. What's going on? He knew something was up. So then um, Micaiah comes, he prophesies, and basically they still go to war because, again, there's a higher power manipulating Jehoshaphat. Because even though Micaiah came and said, don't go, you know, you shouldn't go because they're going to kill you. Jehoshaphat still heard from God, but still went along with it. He was getting manipulated. And because he was getting manipulated, the one thing I want to point to you guys, I got the revelation right now while I was on this slide. Thank you, Jesus Christ. You're so amazing. Holy Spirit is amazing, you guys. The fact that Ahab told Jehoshaphat, you dress up as king and I'm going to go incognito, is telling you that Ahab set up Jehoshaphat to get Jehoshaphat killed. They were associated. I mean, they were in an alliance. They were friends. But he set him up to get him killed. Because what happened in verse... Um, this, is, this is your recap, girl. This is your recap. Um, in verse 30, it tells the king of Aram, Aram, yeah, the king of Aram had told all his officials, don't worry about anybody else, just find the king of Israel, Ahab. Because it tells you in verse um, 22, the Lord had put a lying spirit in all the prophets, for the Lord had pronounced your doom. God had already established on this day, bam, he's going to die. So everything the spiritual realm was going to work towards this man dying on that particular day. Okay? So now Aram, the king goes, guys, forget everybody else. Get the king and kill him. And then, they see Jehoshaphat dressed as a king. They run after Jehoshaphat to kill him. And I bet you Ahab was probably just staring like, ha ha, look at that. My trick worked. His friend set him up, you guys. His friend set him up. Associations. Wrong associations. But then Jehoshaphat calls out to God. And the Lord saved him. He saved him. He was like, oh, my son's calling. Let me go rescue him. So if Jehoshaphat had not been there, he would not have had that conundrum. He would not have had to call out to God. He would not be in danger for his life. Guys, your associations matter. I don't care if you've known them since you're in diapers. And I'm telling you this right now. I've had to cut people out. I don't care how long I've known you. You're bad for me. You're bad for me. I can't. It's God and God alone. And if God says you got to go, you got to go. Your heart is not right. Your heart is not right. Because if, the, if that person's heart is not right, guys, the enemy can use them to destroy you. That's an easy access to you. And you just so focus on the emotional aspect of, I've known them since we're in diapers. We learn to crawl together. We learn to walk together. I need to be her best friend. And she's killing you. She's saying curses over you. For her, it's just, oh, I'm just joking. But in the spiritual realm, there's no jokes. There are no jokes in the spiritual realm, guys. There are, there are no jokes. There are no jokes. There, there is no jokes. I promise you, there's no jokes there. What you say is what's happening. She's prophesying doom about you. But you're over here going, but she, we learned to ride bikes together. Uh, um, she's my friend. It's going to hurt. <laughs> Just know that God will comfort you. And he does. He comforts you. And he brings the right people that have the right heart for you. Okay? So he's not going to leave you alone. The isolation period is for you to get pruned and understand what your source of power is. Your source of, just your source in general. 
comes from God. But in order for you to under actually understand that, you need to be isolated for a while. And once he's done with you and you've, and, and guys, the faster you learn this, the quicker the process is. The faster you learn this, the quicker the process is. The journey in the wilderness for the children of Israel, um, historically speaking, geographically speaking, it's supposed to take about 13 days to cross from where they were to Jericho. 13 days. It took them 40 years, past 40 years, because they're complaining. So what that tells us is your complaints, your murmuring, your uh, uh, poor me, uh, pity me, lengthens that time it lengthens that time absolutely listen you guys <laughs> my son went out to a birthday party on saturday on sunday and i was every time i'm around these parents i'm uneasy like there's something wrong and god has not shown me anything but i know something is horribly wrong so every time my son's like, let's go play I'm, after camp, I'm like, mm, five minutes. And I set my alarm just to make sure, five minutes, let's go. Because I am not, I don't feel safe around them at all. So um, I've never told my husband this. I've never told him this. So they had a birthday, they had a birthday celebration on Sunday. And I went to church. My husband took the boys there. And he was like, Bab, I'm never doing that again. I was like, what happened? He's like, he goes, I've, I've al I'm always so uncomfortable around them. I'm like, you didn't tell me. <laughs> he goes, I am so uncomfortable around them. I, there's something wrong. When I'm around them, I feel irritated by them. So that's how I feel, exactly how I feel. When I'm around them, I get irritated. I'm like, I need to leave right now. I need to get away from them right now. But my son's like, let's play, let's play. And I'm like, five minutes. And, and it's not my usual voice. It's not my usual comments. It's like, where's my phone? All right, okay, five minutes, five minutes. All right, you see, I there's no peace. It's just something is wrong and God has still not revealed to me what it's wrong. I, I don't know what it's wrong. But my husband tell me that. I was like, I am so sorry, babe. I could have told you not to go, but I thought you didn't have that. I didn't know you had the same uneasiness that I had. He was like, it was so bad when I was there. The place was so filthy. And I was just looking around like, oh my gosh, uh, I need to leave. But our son's having so much fun. And, ooh. And then he said, towards the end, guys, he was so impatient to leave, he left the boys' shoes there. He just got the boys and left. He's like, we gotta go. And so the older one could not find his shoes because they had gone to like the bouncing thing. They'd gone in and out of how They'd done all this stuff that he was so uneasy. He was so uneasy. Like he was so irritated. And it was like, time to go, time to go. And the older one couldn't find his shoes. He's like, you don't need shoes. We have shoes at home. So he lifted him up, took him to the car and was like, we're done. We don't need those shoes. Guys, when you have that unsettled, like, please don't go to people's places. Because I didn't know you had that. I thought it was just me. And I thought I was overreacting. Because I'm super sensitive to things like that. I can tell when somebody is totally opposing to God. Like, my spirit just goes, Arr! like, I can't be around them. So I thought it was just me. Because my husband and I, we're not, um, <laughs> we, he's not like, Zealous like me, he's more like a calm, quiet, da da da, like my my business kind of person. But me, I'm like, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. I can't even preach to them, guys. I am that like, you see what I'm saying? It is a warning. But he left the boys, guys. I had to say a prayer. I was like, those shoes, wherever they are, they cannot use them for any rituals or anything. I don't know the uneasiness, but I know something is horribly wrong with those people. But my son and their son love to play together. And as a parent, I don't have the courage yet to explain to my son that I can't say it's my feelings. I can't say there's something terribly wrong because he's just now learning about the power of God and all these different things. 
anyways camp is over in a, in a week so i only have one week to endure and then we're done like we're done with this particular people child but yeah that's oh don't let your kids go over to people's places guys anyways that was my story to explain to associations i can't explain to our seven-year-old associations yet but um he has friends that we are very very comfortable with but that particular person oh my gosh you guys it's i don't know mm -mm, mm -mm. yeah that means if somebody's been in christ for ages decades um they're not really in christ because if you feel like that that means they're operating under a false spirit not the true spirit of god <laughs> then guys like holy spirit like and i just want him to reveal what it is but i think they're in new age like in deep new age stuff that my spirit just cringes around them like i cannot i feel irritated I just didn't know that my husband had the same thing because if he, if I'd known that, I would said I would have said no. We're not going to that birthday party. Like I can tell my son no to something, but his dad, like my husband, really loves taking them out, showing them this and this and this and this. So I don't want to take that away from him if he wasn't uneasy like I was. I, like as long as I'm not going, I'm fine. You know. yes oh guys i prayed that morning the morning they were going to the i prayed i was like i was getting them ready doing their hair i was like the blood of jesus the blood of jesus i was praying arm of god everything yes oh praise god yeah get like at least you're introducing the children to god that's really really good but guys associations are so big because imagine you get together with a person. Let's say it's a marriage. You get together with a person who's not of God. And they don't want you to like pray. They don't want you doing anything Jesus. That's going to ruin up your destiny. That's going to literally skew your destiny. Um, Spirit transit. Yes. Um, not transit. Mm, guys, hand, laying of hands. Just touch. Touch uh, could bring like a, a emotional soul tie, like touch. Yes, the questions are biblical. But um, spirits could transfer through. I can see a spirit transferring through a handshake because that's an agreement. It's an agreement, guys. This, you are agreeing, okay? So be very careful when you shake hands. I shake hands in church with one particular person. That's it. Everybody else, I'm just like, <laughs> we're here for deliverance. Like, no, no, no. Like, handshakes. Our agreement I'm agreeing with whatever you want to give me right now okay do not compromise guys do not compromise praise God yeah it is so crazy when oh my god guys I promise you rather stay single than be with somebody who doesn't want you to have God because that's just crazy yes full arm of god on at all times i do that daily at night yes yes guys <laughs> this week okay last week uh the holy spirit was revealing to me something about my sibling because i was asking i know i mentioned it on the live how somebody that was close to us had done something to me and i knew about me right but i didn't know about my siblings but the way they had done it to my siblings was they had hugged my siblings and that's how the agreement was initiated. So I, I broke it last week, but it's just they connected that through the hug. They got their agreement through that hug. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, guys, you're, you're like, I can't even go to a hairdresser. Like, that's why my... If, Jeremy, if you pray... God will literally show you how to find that person. Like, because I know guys are supposed to, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So you, like, you need that. But if you just go to God, he will lead you to the right person. He will lead you to the right person. I promise you. My husband was not looking for a God-fearing woman. He was just looking for somebody who was, I don't even know what he was looking for. Because I wasn't going to marry him initially anyways. Yeah, don't just hug anybody, guys. Don't just hug anybody, please. 
it is agreement a kiss is an agreement a hug is an agreement a handshake is an agreement don't let anybody just touch your head if you know they are of God then sure touch your head this is impartation they're literally imparting the right hand it comes up a lot in the scripture that the right hand like Jesus Christ on the right hand of the Father with the right hand I win wars the right hand is where like the power comes through so if somebody is doing this and they don't worship God what are they transferring into you what are they imparting into you okay yeah Jeremy just stay at the stay at the altar and tell God, uh, I want her to have this, this. I want her to fear you. That's the main thing. I want her to fear you, Lord. And then, you know, be compassionate, be nurturing. I promise you, you're going to see that person. And it's going to be a random place. You're going to be like, and then you, it's almost like you get that peace. Because my husband's like, when I saw you, I knew you were my wife. And I'm like, what? When I saw you, I was like, but God, for men, God gives you that, like, this is the person. He gives you that inclination so you know that's the person for you. No, hugging someone is not bad. But I definitely have to make sure I just don't hug anyone. Because hugging is agreement. Yeah, if someone's of God, please hug. Hug away. But imagine hugging a witch. Just imagine that. Imagine that. I have definitely hugged people. Let me tell you what I, what happened to me one time. I hugged somebody, and I was, as I was fi finishing hugging them, my entire body in this area was, like, um, tingling. Tingling. And I'm like, okay, I had to go into spiritual warfare. Like, Lord, whatever that was, it can't come into me or touch me. Tingling. And it was not the Holy Spirit. Yes. He will direct you. God is amazing, guys. He knows the right person for you. That's an awesome question. Listen, I um <sighs> put on the arm of God. <laughs> put on the arm of God before you hug her. Or the blood of Jesus Christ before you hug her. But I I, I promise you guys that like, your spirit will know. Like, when I go into a certain family member's house, I know I can't stay long. Because I already feel the presence of things. I'm just like, okay, I, I need to get out of here. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's almost like they're all watching you. Like, where is she going to go next? But, you know, family is family. But I limit time with those people. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> I'll just, do you have a baby? I'll keep busy. But it's not crazy. You feel drained after being around her because the spirit of heaviness comes upon you from her. Guys, this topic is associations. I'm literally trying to tell you that when you are around people who don't like God or have rejected God, it affects you spiritually. It affects you spiritually. It drains you spiritually. No. So the only way a spirit could transfer without any contact to you is if you say yes. Let's say somebody says, I am schizophrenic. The spirit of schizophrenia heard you say that and it will just jump into you. It can come into you because you are agreeing through your mouth. Or if somebody says, you are so crazy, ha, ha, ha. And you're like, that's true, girl, ha, ha, ha. Crazy is jumping into you. Okay. So that's why you can't like let people just joke around about you with these words that are actually detrimental. Crazy is madness in the head. Crazy is nothing to be proud of, right? So when somebody's saying something that's not aligning with the word of God, you need to reject that. No, I'm not crazy. I have the mind of Christ. Even if they're laughing, saying, ha ha, no, I'm not crazy. I have the mind of Christ. Does that make sense, guys? It's question time. I think I, you know what? Let me make sure I looked at every single verse. Oh, yeah. I also want to mention Hebrews 1.14. And Hebrews 1.14 tells us that aren't angels ministering spirits? 
sent to those who are here to salvation. So angels are ministering spirits. Ministering, ministering means serving. So they serve us um, because we are here to salvation. And the way you activate or use angels is when you use the word of God for your life. Like, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. When you use scriptures, angels start working for you. They work for God, but they start working on your behalf. Okay? They work for God, but they start working on your behalf when you use scriptures. Okay? And that is found in Psalms 103 verse 20. Okay, so again, I mentioned that the random arrow, the spiritual realm made sure that the random arrow had a destination, and that was King Ahab through the joints between his armor. Okay. And another thing I want to mention is for my notes, I wrote, in order for the spiritual realm, for the will, for the will to be done in the spiritual realm, man is needed to partner and to do something intentional or random Things so the plans can go forth. So that man was needed to randomly think about shooting an arrow, and the arrow went and found Ahab. It could have been going south, but because the, the spiritual realm was like, he is dying today, it would deter, switch sides, come back by the wind, and hit him. A man had to randomly do something for the will of God to be done, right? The spiritual realm partners with the with a physical person for it to go forth. Does that make sense? The spiritual realm partners with a human being because we are given dominion here on earth. Okay? Whether something appears random or intentional, it's a partnership between man and God or man and the devil. Okay? So again, um, the heavenly council decided that that day was his last day. And so as the sun set, he had to die before midnight because the the, it was set in heaven. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. So I wrote here something really important. I, wanna, I know I'm talking about associations, right? And we all know this verse that says, walk with the wise, you become wise, walk with the fools, and it will lead you to destruction, right? So when you walk with somebody who is wise, you're getting wisdom. When you walk with somebody who is a fool, and foolish is anybody who rejects God. And I have a video on that somewhere. Go and find it, please. Um, a fool leads you to destruction. Just like Jehoshaphat almost died that day because he was with Ahab, right? But I wrote here that if you're replaced in someone's life, somebody who's a non-believer, you might be the person assigned to preach the gospel to them, to plant the seeds of life to them, right? So sometimes we're in somebody's life or a new business, a new area, a new city to be the revival starter, to be the person that ignites faith in Christ Jesus, who introduces that area to God, okay? So if you're like, you know, God gave me this new friend. I tried getting rid of him and I can't. It seems like God is telling me to stay around him. He's putting you there so you can be an example for that person to find Christ. Right? But that is limited. It's never like a long-term thing where the person would change your heart away from God. It's always like you're in their life to introduce them to God. To show them the ways of the Lord, to show them the character of God, to show them that you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't walk by the flesh, you don't walk by sight, you walk by faith, you walk by the Spirit. All of that is examples that you're showing that person, okay? It's not for you to be like, God told me to hang out with my drunkard friend, I'm going to hang out with my drunkard friend and then take a beer myself. No, God told you to hang around your drunkard friend so you can speak life into your drunkard friend. You influence drunkard friend, not the other way around. Does that make sense, guys? So if you're the only person in your family who knows Christ, praise God, 
Hallelujah. You have a huge assignment on your life to get them to see Christ Jesus. To take them away from hell. To introduce Christ Jesus to them. For them to see how you emulate Christ in your everyday life. Do you cast them out? Do you read your Bible? Do you fast? Do you pray? Do you say words of curses over them? Or do you speak life into them? Do you correct them when they go against the, the, like the words of God? Like if someone is lying and you find out they're lying, call them out. Like stop lying. There's no such thing as a white lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. You are helping them to find the truth. But then you have to hold yourself to the same account, of, like the same account, right? You have to be accountable. When, when something goes wrong, you realize, you know, I did something in this situation. My uh, reaction was not um, godly. I have to apologize to you. I'm sorry that I overreacted. And they're going to be taken aback like, wow, she actually came back and apologized. That is not like her at all. That is not like her at all. What is happening to her? You are emulating Christ Jesus' character. You, ha you are using what God has given you. You are humbling yourself and realizing it is not about you, but it's about Christ. It is not about you, but it's about God being glorified. God being revealed through you. God being glorified through you all the time, every day. You are an ambassador for God. Not an ambassador for me. I'm not an ambassador for Prem. I don't care. Like Prem, huh, what would Prem be doing right now? I'll probably be napping right now. Taking a nap, you guys. I, I love naps. Yeah. Uh, I love reading. Yes. Uh, I love to write. Um, so I would just be doing something like that. But it's not about me. It's about Christ Jesus and his kingdom being glorified and furthered. G Jesus Christ revealed to man. Jesus Christ glorified. That is the goal. That is the goal. If, it, if, it, if it's within your family, let's say for example, and people don't like people, let me explain a simple concept. Um, I don't know if it's simple. Let me just explain something. Um, sometimes we tend to want to rescue everybody but our family. Everyone out there, like I'm evangelizing. Come to Jesus. He loves you. Your life is going to be great. Come to Jesus. But your actual family you're like, I don't want to talk to y'all. I don't care if y'all go to hell. <laughs> Guys, I know it's hard. It is not easy. I understand that. I have tried that with some of my in-laws. And they looked at me like, can you give me physical evidence that God exists, Primrose? And I'm like, guys, put your intellect on the side. Let's talk about God for a little bit. He's the spirit. But they want physical evidence. And I'm like, I I'm alive. I, I I'm I'm physical. Like you're physical. Like you. So it I know it's hard. It is hard. But what can help is that when you have a transformation of the mind, when your heart transforms, when your character is more like the character of Jesus, it's easier for you or for them to understand that there's a transformation in this person. Then we just like blah 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 blah. Okay. Praise God. It's good, Malisha. So you're praying and she's evangelizing. Hallelujah. Listen, you do the best you can. And then you ask God. You intercede. Your intercession is so God will send another harvester, another person to preach to them. So you already planted the seed that Christ is the only way to heaven. Now somebody else will come and water that seed. Okay? Do not feel obligated. Do not carry false burdens. It is not our job to convince anyone. It is not our job. That is why I don't debate on this channel. You don't see me debating anyone. If you want to go to hell, that's your prerogative. Go wherever you want to go. But I will teach you and tell you that Christ Jesus is the only way. I don't convince my family. Anybody in my family who's in witchcraft, I don't convince them. I, I show them the light. If, you don't, if they want the light, hallelujah. If they reject the light, they can. They have free will to reject the light. Only God, only the Holy Spirit can transform the heart. 
but I also want to tell you a really good scripture that I found out and I was like wow it says the goodness of God brings people to repentance the goodness of God brings man to repentance let me find it the goodness of God brings man to repentance you guys so when people see the goodness of God through your life they're going to repent and come to Jesus let me tell you the scripture so you guys can have some sound mind and sound heart not worry about other people Romans 2 4 Romans 2 4 he urges us to come to repentance and as we read Romans 2 4 he patiently waits for us the goodness of God the goodness of God leads people to repentance. When you see how good God is, no one has to convince you of anything. You're just going to be like, oh, I am so sorry, Lord. I was, um, I was acting up. I was a fool. But I'm here to repent. Please have mercy on me. Don't send me to hellfire. Okay? Don't convince them. Don't convince them. It's not your job. The goodness of God will lead them to repentance. Hi, Julie. The goodness of God. Like, I don't... My switch from being lukewarm to being like on fire, like Jeremiah says, my bones are on fire, my heart is set on fire. That switch happened when I, I started being consistent with God in the morning, just spending time with Him every single morning. At first, I was doing it like Monday through Friday, business hours only business days only and the weekend i'm sleeping in i'm only doing this because i have to get up in the morning to go to work so yeah lord i'll see you monday through friday and then i, I started getting convicted like he'll wake me up during the weekend i'm like lord remember we said monday through friday like weekend is when to sleep in it doesn't matter how hard i try to sleep in y'all the sleep will not come host was like it's time to get up <laughs> so now I joyfully get up on the weekend. Okay? Um, I tell them I'm spending time with God. Where are you? I'm spending time with God. Or I'm reading the Bible. Or like I don't really do too many social events. I let my husband do that stuff, you guys. He, he's not social, but he, he puts up the social front for, for the family. He, he will go for the family. To represent the family, which means me. Um, I'd rather he goes than no one goes. And I cover him in prayer and that's it. I don't care for all that stuff anymore. Um, if it's not Bible, if it's not something that I'm like, okay, Jesus is glorified. God is revealed. Praise God. Mark 3, 26 to 30, okay. I'll mark, I'll write it down and I'll read it later if that's okay. Um, yeah, so I told you association verse already. And I feel like I have something else to tell you guys. Yeah, so they walk with the wise and become wise. And then walk with the fools and become going to destruction is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Proverbs 13, 20. I love that proverb because it speaks so much. Guys, when you look warm, you can walk with whoever you want. It's fine. Once you get on fire for God, you have to cut ties. And when God places you in the places with other people who are not believers, it's for one assignment. Jesus revealed. Jesus glorified. That's it. Reveal Jesus to them through your character, through your way, the way you talk, through whatever you're doing. Or, and glorify God in what you do, right? And then I have a few other bonus, uh, bonus scriptures. Wait, let me write what she wrote. What scripture did she write? What scripture did she write? Mark, Mark 320, 326 to 30. Okay, I'll read it. I'll read it, Gina. Thank you. Um, the other scriptures I want to give you guys is Galatians chapter 5 or 16 to 18. And you guys know that one. It's like basically talking about walking the spirit, not the flesh. It tells you what the characteristics are of somebody who walks in the flesh versus somebody who walks in the spirit. Then 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And 
and um I feel like I want to, I wanted to read one of these but I didn't I didn't I did not mark it okay let's this let's let's find it it's okay let's find the scripture as you can tell guys I, I still like paper I don't know I still like paper paper Bible Galatians 5 um, 7 okay so that's the same one that says we we'll walk by faith not by sight so Galatians 5 um, 7 in New Living Translation states for we live by believing and not by saying right so when you pray for something or pray for someone you believe that they're healed not by seeing physical eyes that they're healed okay so don't put false burdens on yourself it's not your work it's God's work right like I'm not the one getting embarrassed Holy Spirit this is you getting embarrassed you see what I'm saying so God is gonna show up like I've told him that like Lord when I pray for this person please heal them it's not my work it's not my it's not my ministry it's your it's your stuff I'm just doing what you told me to do so you have to show up you have to show up Lord it is your work it is your person I didn't create this person I didn't create this havoc in their life you want them set free you have to show up and he shows up guys he is true to his word first John 2 6 let's read first John 2 6 that's also pertaining to relationships uh, first John 2 6 Romans first John is like one of those little little by little there you go two six hmm. so that one says those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did so we can't say that Jesus Christ hang out with the sinners yeah, we can say that only because Jesus Christ hang out with sinners to bring them to repentance, not to hang out with them and become like them, right? Associations matter. Who you hang around matters. Who you spend your time with matters. Who you build alliances with matter, okay? And then we have another verse, Romans 12, 2. Book of Romans, the letter written to the Romans. We're almost done. I'll do questions. I just have to make sure you guys understand associations. Please. Okay, so Romans 12 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So this one is the same verse that basically says, um, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Okay? So we only renew our minds on this, on this, guys. This. This is it. That's it. Okay? And if you want an example, another example of associations that were detrimental, read the book of Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 25, and it talks about a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira? Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, they were married, and they both decided to lie to the Holy Spirit, and they both died. So they had the lie. <laughs> they talked to each other and said, hey, let's lie about this. And they died, like, one after the other. The husband comes in and lies, and he dies and then the wife comes in and lies about the money that has sold the the property or the building for and then she dies associations matter somebody can literally get you to say the wrong thing or lie about something and that could be the last lie you tell i'm just i'm just letting you guys know don't just build associations like it's it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. In the spiritual realm, it's a big deal. It's agreements. It's agreements. Okay? Try and start to do that. Get up early in the morning to pray. Just set an alarm clock. Set an alarm. If you have to start work at like 8, for example, um, depending on how long it takes you to get ready, just 
give yourself like 30 minutes and just get up in the morning for 30 minutes and spend 30 minutes with God. He honors that. Oh, thank you. Renewal of your mind, yes. Praise God, Romans 12, 2. Praise God. Yeah, I, 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 I need my Bible. I need to mark and highlight. And as you can see, like, I have different Bibles, but, like, depending on which one I'm reading, I'm highlighting, I'm marking, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But, yeah, the main one I use is New Living Translation because I use this to teach you guys. I use this to, like, but I love King James Version. King James is, like, my my go-to. Amen. Led by the Spirit, guys. Beauty Spark, that's an excellent question. So be as wise as a serpent, but as gentle as a dove is in the book of Matthew. And it's referring to us coming out as um, we are sheep among wolves, right? Serpents are wise, you guys. Serpents are wise. We can't say they're not wise because the very first animal that is responsible that the enemy used, like went into the serpent and used it was the serpent. So the reason serpents are wise is because they're cunning. They will um, study their prey, study their prey, and then snap at you. And people barely survive when a, a serpent like attacks. So if we look at the story of um, Eve, right? So Eve, we can't say, like I can't say that the serpent came to her one time. The serpent probably came multiple times and saying, hey Eve, the serpent came with embodied by Satan, right? It requires a body to speak to a, a person. It's like, hey Eve, have you seen that fruit over there? No, I can't eat it. All right, cool. I'll come back tomorrow. Hey, Eve, you see that fruit over there? Because it literally says that later on, when she was ready to, when the serpent really talked to her, she, her perception changed. She perceived that the fruit was good for food. Her perception had not changed prior to that. So when it says, be as wise as a serpent, do not your, let your perceptions be skewed by this world. Do not let anybody present to you something that seems good, but it's not good. You have to be as wise as a serpent. Like there, the enemy is cunning. Like First Peter chapter five verse eight says, "Be as wise." No, no, no. Be vigilant and sober-minded, for the enemy walks around like a lion, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So that goes back to that be as wise as a serpent. Because when it comes to you, you need to understand that, okay, you are sneaky, you are cunning, you can trick me. Uh, I need to be on my P's and Q's. I can't just take anybody touching my head if I have not tested the spirit. I can't just take anybody praying for me if I have not tested the spirit. I can't just take anybody uh, prophesying over me saying, oh, you're so dumb. It's a prophecy, guys. It's a prophecy. Um, but you're just saying like, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, no. I rebuke in the name of Jesus. I, am, I have the sound mind of Christ. So serpents are, you have to be wise as in when something is presented to you, do not let it shift your perception. Like look at it from the spiritual realm. Like, okay, you are saying that you want to bring me food. I have not talked to you in 5,000 years. Why do you want to bring me food again? Don't ask them, but ask yourself, why would a person that I have not talked to for years want to bring me food? Like, why? Like, I'm, I'm not starving. I didn't ask anybody or announce on social media, guys, I am starving. I'm on the bridge. I need food. No. So why would they want to bring me food? It's literally you using critical thinking. Critically thinking about every decision you make before you jump in. Because we are sheep among wolves. Wolves will slyly walk around coming like sheep just to destroy you. You guys know the story of, um, was it Little Red Riding Hood? Where the wolf wanted to eat her 
guys, like, they'll do whatever they can to take you out. Discernment. There you go. Thank you. Discernment. Discernment. Absolutely. There you go. Food is a covenant. Food is a covenant, okay? You have a question. Yes, go ahead. Guys, questions can come now. Does that help you, Spark? That you have to really be discerning and that when I felt that in the pit of my stomach, every time I'm around these people that my child was playing with, I should have stayed away. I mean, but the Holy Spirit did speak to me for that particular um, family. He said, always keep an eye on your sons. When I'm around this man, he's like, keep an eye on your sons. So I appreciate that, but I wanted more information. So that's you being as wise as a serpent, understanding that I need to keep eyes on my children around this particular person because God is like, something is wholly wrong. That's a really good question. How did you build a relationship with Jesus? Um, so I started by just waking up in the morning and spending time with him. But you could do it as in 6 p.m. You don't have to be a morning person like me. You could do like every day at 6 p.m. I have a an appointment make it like an appointment I have an appointment with my creator and you sit down you have your Bible if you want if you like jotting things down get a notebook or something get a pen and just start you know you have an appointment just like you know you have an appointment at the dentist and you're like I can't be late I have to be there at 6 p.m. same concept meet God at the time like set time for him I say mornings because once you have met with God in the morning, my day goes super smooth. Like, it's almost like I can set and command my day to go a certain way. If I do evening, my day's almost already gone. I've had to fight all these things that were happening throughout the day. But I could have had insight on all of that prior to going out in the world already. So I do mornings because in the morning while I'm there and I'm just spending time with him, I read my Bible. The last thing I do is read my Bible. I start with just worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. And then um, I go into tongues. After tongues, I generally start praying. And while I'm praying, I start getting sleepy. Because at this point, it's like an hour has passed, an hour and a half has passed. I start kind of dozing off. And while I doze off, I go into a vision. And that vision is usually telling me what I need to cancel, what I need to break down, um, or how the day is going to be like, or what I've broken out of. It's amazing. Okay, so morning is best for me, but if you are not a morning person, you can meet God every day at 6 p.m. So you know, guys, I have to be home at 6 p.m. Between 6 and 7, I am with God. And that's what you do. This, this could be considered an appointment, yes, because you're, you are learning something. Absolutely. You are learning something. But for me, it's not considered an appointment. This is considered me um, giving God my love language. So I'm a acts of service kind of person. My love language is acts of service, someone doing something for me. So I give God what I also love, but I know that God prefers spending time with him. So I will not come on this app and speak to you guys until I spend time with him because his love language that he prefers is um quality time he loves he loves quality time just spending time with him so me coming on here to do a teaching is me giving him um acts of service <laughs> but i'm also doing what i was born to do like everybody when you were brought onto this earth there's an assignment for you and once you discover your assignment you're gonna get so much joy and peace because you feel like okay yes thank you jesus i know what i have to do now so that's what I'm doing right now. But yes, for you, it's um, it's an appointment with God. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jalimo. I hope that helped Frederick Clayton. Just set a time for God every single day. I, re I recommend every single day. But you can start like me. I said, Lord, Monday through Friday. We're, we're meeting Monday through Friday. Because I did it selfishly. Because I knew Monday through Friday, I have to get up early and go to work. So if I met God at, let's say, 5 o'clock in the morning, and that was an hour, and then I started getting ready for work at 6, 
no problem. I just get up an hour earlier. Um, but if it's like a, a Saturday or a Sunday, I'm like, Lord, I want to sleep in. Um, God took that out, out of me already so I can get up on the weekend. I thank him for that. But at first, we were fighting. We were like, I was like, no, mm -mm, I'm sleeping in on the weekend. But what ended up happening was I would wake up at 5 and just lay there. And I start going to visions. Or he, just, he just starts talking to me like, okay, so what are we doing today? And I'm like, eh, I just want to stay in bed. It's comfortable, but I know what he's talking about. Get up. Let's spend time together. So now I don't mind it. I actually enjoy it. I look forward to it. Okay, hold on. Let me see. I missed some questions. Oh, you're welcome. So that's how you also, Khadija, that's, all, that's how I also discovered my assignment with God. Because um, people can prophesy, visions can come, dreams can come. But the word of God is the filtration system for everything. And so I had to get to be with God first. And then he was able to show me why he created me. Like why I was sent on this earth. So when I started spending time with him, he sent me to this particular scriptures because I was like, God, why am I, why am I here? What is the purpose? Everybody looks like they're doing something monumental, and I'm over here doing like going to work. Yeah, my job is fine. Yeah, I get paid well, but whatever. Like I just felt like there was more to life than just going to work, raising children, having fun with your family on the weekend. I was like, God, there has to be more to it, and that's how He was able to show me that you were created for this. Your assignment in Christ comes after you spend time with God. He will tell you what it is. Oh, good question. What do I do? So my quality of time, uh, I said I started off, I always start with repenting. I know I have just woken up. I always say, Lord, I am so sorry. So First John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and purify you of all unrighteousness. So the reason I always start with repenting is in case I had a dream where I did something wrong within the dream, I did a sin in the dream, I repent and that covers that. So I always repent first. And once I say 1 John 1, 9, I repent of my sins, I confess my sins, wash me in the precious blood of Jesus, then I go into um, worshiping him. I just start to sing. Sometimes I may use um, like headphones and listen to a song and sing by myself. Sometimes I just sing by myself. Like a song will come to my mind. Holy Spirit is amazing. When I'm waking up, he's already telling me, my spirit is already singing a certain song. So that song is what I'm going to be singing to worship him that day, that morning. So my song is given to me when I'm waking up. Like a certain song will come to mind while I'm literally like getting up in the morning. Um, so I do this. I'll do the repentance. I do the song. I go into tongues. And I spend some time in tongues because he's just now teaching me how to stay in tongues longer than five, ten minutes. So I stay in tongues. And then um, I will, I will pray words. And then tongues. I just kind of change, interchange. For example, I would say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me inside the still waters, he restores my soul. So I, I just infuse tongues throughout. That's what I do now. I used to just say words, but tongues are super powerful. The more I spoke in tongues, the more visions I saw. That's why I, I started to like take that very, very seriously. And then, um, I read the Bible. Um, so while I'm doing the tongues, I'm also doing spiritual warfare at the same time. And then I have like a notebook. I start writing what comes to mind. And then sometimes that's how I get the topics to teach you guys. I'll read a certain scripture and then like I'll, I'll, I'll start writing it out. And then he'll give me way more information than what I read or he'll connect it to a different scripture in like a different book. And so I'll try to like bring them all together. Yeah, so that's how I do. Like I take notes, I write. Um, and sometimes if I have nothing to write, I'll just start writing. Holy Spirit, I love you. Yeah, hair is glory. That's right. I'll start writing like, Lord, I thank you for this. I thank you for that. If I'm feeling really ungrateful, y'all, I write down what he has done in my life. Like I'm healthy. My family's healthy. We've never had COVID. 
we we're we're thriving we're doing fine yes i want this and that but if it's not your will then it is not your will you see what i'm saying like i look at the positive so when you start writing out what he has done for your life you you stop worrying about what you, what you don't have i hope that makes sense So whenever you, you feel tired and it's difficult to pray, go into tongues. It's a spirit of slumber, slumber. And I have a prayer for that. I have a, I have a prayer for a spirit of slumber. Yes. When you listen to worship music on YouTube and prayers while you work, it is considered quality time, but make sure that you also spend time uninterrupted with him because you're working. You're not 100% focused on him. You're working, right? Let's, I'm just imagine. I'm just thinking you type. So you say you're typing and you're working, working, you listen to watch me. That's great. But also ensure that you have in your 24 hours, you spend at least at least 20 minutes uninterrupted with him. Just 20 minutes like, Lord, I'm here. I have this offense. This person offended me. Let's take care of this, Lord. Just tell him how you feel. Tell him what's going on. No, I've never been vaccinated against COVID. That's why I lost my six-finger job. <laughs> they fired me, you guys. They fired me because I would not get vaccinated. So, nope. God told me no. So, I had to, y'all, I have to listen to God. It's, it's crazy, but that was my testing. It was like, do you, what's more important, your six-figure six job or me? And I was like, Lord, you. You know, but it takes faith to even get to that point. Listen, I didn't have a mentor. Um, I learned from, you know what? Um, let me tell you the one person that got me so interested in reading the, the Bible. And I just started by listening to him. Kevin L.A. Ewing. During the pandemic, I started listening to him. Because I was desperate because the churches are closed, right? Because my my thing of I'm a Christian was go to church every Sunday for one hour, have a donut, have a coffee, and you're done. So I thought if I died, I'll go to heaven. Guys, if I had died, I would not have gone to heaven. I would have gone straight to the pits of hell. But I didn't know that, right? I thought I was on the way to heaven. So when the pandemic happened, um... The church is closed. You couldn't go to church. So I was like in a panic mode. Like, oh my God. My one, it was like a tradition, like a ritual. Like me going to church was what was telling me that I was going to go to church. I was going to go to heaven one day. I was going to meet Jesus Christ. I love Jesus, but was not reading my Bible. I only heard the one scripture that they would talk about whenever they talked about it. And the church I used to go to, they used to talk about Jacob and Esau every single Sunday. We talked about Jacob and Esau. I don't know what fascination was with this particular teaching, but it was like for an entire year. We talked about Jacob and Esau. So that's all I heard about. Even my husband and I kept joking like, oh my God, guess what the topic is, babe? Jacob and Esau. And we'll laugh about it. Y'all, if we had died, Lord have mercy. Like that's all I have to say. Lord have mercy. Because I was this righteousness thing, this pick up your cross every day, deny yourself every day thing. I was not doing that. I was not doing that. But I I got the love to um, read and study the Bible from Kevin Eller Ewing. And somebody sent it, somebody from London, one of my friends in London, sent me a teaching on monitoring spirits that he was teaching. And it was just a random WhatsApp message. And I was like, huh. I listened to it. I was intrigued. And then after that, I was like, all of that is in the Bible? That's crazy. So, guys, I started reading the Bible because, like, the way he found all these things in there. Um, I, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give God a chance. I'm going to do 21-day challenge. I'm going to meet with him every morning for 21 days, Monday through Fridays only, no weekends. I'm sleeping on the weekend. Um, and that's how I got started. Yeah. So that's how I really fell in love with the word. And then that's how he told me, like, you know, your job is to teach, like, teach people how to. It's interesting. How do I go into visions? Listen, I'm just praying, 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 doing whatever. And I'm just laying there, half asleep, half not asleep, 
still praying somewhere and then i'll see something like this morning i saw a a, a colored bird this bird was wearing like you know joseph joseph's mantle of coat of colors similar so i didn't fully understand what the bird was what, why the feathers were all different colors so i said lord if that bird that vision was of you i come in agreement with it but if it was none of you i rebuke it i reject it i refuse the name of jesus i'll set it on fire just because i'm like okay so joseph had a full like you know a coat of colored of color a mantle but um you know i wasn't fully understanding what the bird because it a vision is like really short so he, he just flew and came and landed and just was there so my visions are just like something happens or the other day i was sleeping sleeping praying because this mine lasts about two hours i'm downstairs like for about two hours i'm there you know do my thing going into tons in and out and then i saw i think i went to sleep i saw myself walking up a hill and I looked over, but I was hedged in. There's people outside from my old job, the one I, the one I got fired from for not taking the vaccine. Um, there, one of them is sitting by herself, looking really, really sad. And I'm over here, like I was walking up the hill, singing to myself. And she just kind of looks over, like, hmm. And then I continue, and then showers started coming. Like it started rain showers of blessings, just my area. I was like, wow, Lord showers of blessings oh yeah so i saw that on tuesday class. no thursday class. i told you guys about showers of blessings on thursday so i was like oh lord showers of blessings yeah that's what i got when i was like, i was kind of waking up from that vision was like showers of blessings are coming showers of blessings are coming my children you guys are hedged in like there's a hedge around us y'all so if you're in christ jesus you have a hedge and showers are coming i got that last thursday so i just i'm just minding my business and the vision comes so but i have to say the vision started when i started doing in tongues like praying in tongues oh wow praise god god showed you yes malisha please go to bed i know you're in south africa it's really late that's why i, I try to get it on early because of my south african zambia people because you guys are like up late 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 but yeah, please go to bed. God bless you. God bless you. I pray and have your protection around you and your sister. Continue praying and praising God and worship, worship, worship. Okay? Bye. Wow. Praise God. How do you pray in tongues? It's a gift. It's a gift, guys. It's a gift that you have to desire, really desire it. Because God says, uh, mm, the scripture says, let me see what it says. It's, it's a past tense. Guys, the Bible is past tense, which tells us that if you want something, blessed are those, Ephesians says, the spiritual gifts are being given to you. Hold on. Let me, let me look up the, it's a gift that's given to us already, but you have to really want it and have faith that you'll get it and then you'll get it. Because you don't have faith that you'll get it and your faith wavers, you won't get it. So I want it so bad that I was just like, Lord, please, please. <laughs> and then, yeah, let me see. Um, the gift of tongues. I know there's a scripture that talks about it. And it says, those who have received it. Um, but what I did was, I, I looked up everything where the spirit of god was involved so then i was like wow it's almost like i had a light bulb moment like i really got illumination to how important the holy spirit was i was like, okay so without the holy spirit jesus will not be born without the holy spirit he could not start his ministry without the holy spirit Jephthah could not go in and do that war without the holy spirit gideon would not do anything so i just it was i realized his ministry his importance and then i started saying i thank you holy spirit thank you holy spirit and as i thanked him my thank you became a different tongue so it's a revelation of understanding who he is as a person and his impact and how like wait a minute if christ could not do anything without the holy spirit what am i doing that's why i'm i'm fighting flesh so hard I'm supposed to have the Holy Spirit to help me fight flesh. 
that's how fighting flesh became easier, guys. Um, where's the scripture I want to I want to do? Um, the scripture for it, but it says the gifts you have received, past tense. So we have it. You just have to actually call it from the spiritual realm. You have it spiritually. You have it already. It's 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 part of being an ambassador for Christ Jesus. But you need to pull it out from the spiritual realm into the physical by desiring it, like really genuinely desiring it. And I'll tell you that that's how I um um a one who speaks in tongues. Mm, can't find the scripture. There's like fifty scriptures talking about the the gift of the spirit. Um. I'll have to find a scripture and I might do a video on it. But what I have to tell you guys is it is so much easier to fight flesh when you're speaking tongues. When you have the spirit of God, y'all, like it is so, for me, let me go back. It is for me, it's easier. Like flesh, I can fight flesh easier when I have the spirit of God that way. When I understood, I was like, I don't know what, what I was doing before that. I don't understand what I was doing before that. Like, I don't even know how I survived this earth without having the gift of the spirit like that. Because it's so much easier. This back and forth, back and forth, the flesh, it doesn't really happen. Because you're like so much more, it strengthens you so much more. Because I'm praying in the spirit, I'm praying in the spirit. You feel like, like you're getting poured into. It's almost like you feel like your cup is getting poured, I'm poured, I'm poured. Strengthened, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense, guys. Yes, trust is timing. Okay, I won't say it. Kevin Ella Irwin. Yes, guys, that's who taught. I have not watched Worm. Yeah, Kevin Ella Irwin is who got me to like. Wow, this Bible is actually before before that. Before that, um, I was like, I'll just listen to other people talk about the Bible. You know, I was like the lukewarm person. I would just go to church just to say I went to church because in my mind it was like there's an angel sitting there with a book and it's like Primrose went to church. Tick. Primrose went to church. Tick. And I thought that would get me to heaven. Like I legit thought that was it. Good night, Malaysia. Please go to bed. That's true. Thank you, ZZ. Because I was like, I don't know what that meant, but thank you, Lord. And I just wrapped up. Just start my day. Guys, the name of Jesus is powerful. Like, the name of Jesus. When you understand the government of Jesus Christ, that's all I can say. I have not listened to Tony Evans. <laughs> Guys, he, he gets on all of our nerves. Oh, you can get other gifts. So Paul tells us, if you desire the gift of prophecy, you get the gift of prophecy. Like, I didn't know I had the gift of word of knowledge. But somehow, while I was praying for people, like, hosts would tell me certain things about them. And I'm like, hmm... So you can desire certain gifts and pray for them and you can get them. Absolutely. As long as you're walking in the will of God and you're using them to reveal Jesus and glorify Jesus. Amen. Bye, Zane. Go to sleep, sweetie. God bless you. God, God bless you guys. All the Zambians of Africa, lower parts, guys, good night. Go to bed. Thank you for joining. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Words we write matter. We do all have different gifts. Yes, James 1 5. If you desire wisdom, ask for it, and God who does not, who won't like withhold, will give it to you liberally. Amen. Wait, who laughed at you?
Nemahi, don't worry. That's how people are. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really powerful once you understand. Yep. Yep. That is true. First Corinthians fourteen two is that. <laughs> Which one is that? Is that pulling down vain imaginations? Or is that? Hold on, let me see. First Corinthians fourteen two. Yeah, First Corinthians fourteen two. Oh, it's for guys. I am way past my time. No wonder I'm feeling it. Fourteen two. Yes, 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 yes. So First Corinthians fourteen two says, "For if you have the ability." to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will be all mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages others, and comforts them. So yeah, I visions intensified once I started actually using the gift of tongues in prayer. <laughs> Praise God, yeah. Any last minute questions? So everyone understands associations, guys. Associations are a big deal for us. No, gossip is not cursing some. It could lead to cursing someone. It could lead to it. For example, if you're gossiping, gossiping about someone, like they said somebody had a baby out of wedlock, you're like, yeah, that baby won't make it properly. Like that baby, da, 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 that now it becomes a curse. So you guys were just gossiping that Melanie got pregnant out of wedlock and she's gonna be raising a baby by herself. And it goes from that to, yeah, the baby won't. I don't think she would do well in life with just one parent. That's not positive. That's a curse already. So you're already speaking curses, not meaning to, but you are speaking curses. Oh, praise God. Yes. That's why God says don't gossip. That's why we should not, especially while you're fasting, do not gossip. Oh my gosh, what was your question? No, so you will not understand what you're saying unless the, the Spirit of God gives you interpretation. So one time I was speaking in tongues and he gave me interpretation. But that's only that one time. Most times when I'm speaking in tongues, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying it. I just know it's working. Because once I'm done, I see visions. So I know that it's the Spirit of God interceding for me. So yeah. It, it, the Bible literally tells you, like, when you're speaking in tongues, your mind does not comprehend what you're saying. But the Spirit of God understands what you're saying. God, you're speaking directly to God. The Spirit of God, like, your spirit with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, come together, and now you're speaking directly to God, the will of God for your life. So let's say you don't know, you didn't have a dream about a car accident, but you're speaking in tongues, right? And you're canceling the car accident, untimely death. You didn't know what was going to happen, but your spirit is speaking to God directly and canceling things because you're speaking in tongues. It speaks the will of God for your life, okay? It says, uh, the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, He He prays for us, intercedes for us with groanings, and He speaks what we ought to pray. So what we ought to pray, we don't know. So He prays for us. Okay. Oh, praise God. Yes, we live for Him. I can explain it. So when Paul cast out that uh, divination spirit from that woman, that woman was a monitoring spirit. Like she had a monitoring spirit. And the reason she was following Paul was because she was trying to associate herself to Paul. And that way, once Paul and his cohort left that area, people would be like, we saw her with Paul. That means she has the spirit of God. You see what I'm saying? It was a deceiving spirit. Deceive being spirit remember like the devil is deceiving he's like a master manipulator so she's walking around going these are men of god these are men of god it seems like she's promoting them but that spirit is trying to attach itself to them 
so it can be like an association like associate itself to them so once paul and his cohort leave that area um that woman can do her divination in the name of we are associated with paul and them it was all to deceive people but so paul got irritated because this monitoring spirit was following him around so he cast it out and the other perspective is she didn't want that because her masters were using her for money i pop up on live randomly not specific times Oh, so he cast it out. So the idea is she believed because she was walking behind him. She didn't she was she was enslaved to her masters that were using her for money. So because she was walking around behind him, not only was she monitoring him, she was also wanting freedom. Because she's walking out like if somebody's walking behind you day and day in, day out, day in, she wants freedom, but there's a the witchcraft spirit is ahead of her also trying to do whatever it wants to do but the actual person wanted freedom because she was not benefiting from being a div diviner is that a word i don't know uh, a person who consults in divination she was not benefiting from that the men were benefiting from that because what ended up happening was once paul cast it out all hell broke loose like the people were like you are ruining our business and they charged him and all these other things happened okay so she wanted freedom because she was when when somebody does um divination and witchcraft and necromancy they their will is suppressed and the will of the spirit is forward so the witchcraft spirit was having its will be done on on, on earth and her will was suppressed so she wanted freedom but the witchcraft spirit was like i want money and uh, you're helping us with money i hope that makes sense Bye, girl. Good to see you. No, someone will not go back to her. No. Because she, she got freedom, so she's fine. Which is why her owners were pissed off. It was uh, a spiritual imprisonment. She, she didn't go to get the spirits herself. It was somebody else who used her um illegal in the spiritual realm for monetary gains so she got her freedom and she was perfectly fine right and so the bible says like just christ throughout like throughout the bible like christ was saying like don't sin no more and uh if you don't sin it won't be worse for you so as long as she didn't go back to that and like invoke spirits to come back into her she'll be fine She believed because she was following him. You don't follow somebody you don't believe. So she was monitoring him and wanting freedom. Uh, how are women found by husbands in a holy way? It's just somebody approaching you and like asking you for like a coffee and not like asking you to jump straight into bed with them. Like somebody actually getting to know you, building a friendship right so in this kingdom we don't do one night stands we build a, a foundation and that foundation is a friendship friendship okay it's all right rudy i'm gonna put it on youtube i might not put this questionnaire part because it gets too long i don't know when i'm gonna be on again That's a different kind of tongue. So when I, when it's important, like in a crowd of people, like let's say you're in church and somebody's speaking in tongues, there's people who are newly come to the salvation of Christ Jesus. They need to know what's going on. So Paul is saying, um, make sure that you, somebody else interprets tongues for them. But when I'm praying in tongues by myself, I don't need anybody to interpret those tongues because I'm going into spiritual warfare. I'm praying the will of the Father. I don't need interpretation of that. I'm just building up my spirit. There's different forms of tongues. So one is to edify the people, and the other one is for yourself. Like, you are building up your human spirit as you pray in tongues. 
So when I pray in tongues, let's say I'm praying for somebody and I pray in tongues, I am using, I'm going to war. So in that war time, I am literally, sometimes I, I there's no words that are coming out. It's, a, it's tongues that's coming out. So I have to use tongues in that regard, but I'm doing spiritual warfare. So that one, um, that's just the way I do spiritual warfare. I go into tongues. But the proper way, the proper way is if you're in a setting with people and one of you guys goes into tongues loud enough for everybody to hear, somebody else has to interpret that. Or you yourself have, been, have to interpret that. Let's say you are in church, by, uh, in church, in a church setting, and you go into tongues, but you're praying to yourself. By yourself, you're praying, you're in tongues. Nobody has to interpret that. Let's say you're worshiping God and you go into tongues as part of your worship to God, but it's a short part of it. No one has to interpret that because you're just literally praising God and you went into tongues for a second. That would not discourage somebody. But if you go into tongues for like five, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, people have to know what's going on, especially the new ones, the new uh, converts, right? So he's saying, if somebody's prophesying, if somebody is speaking in tongues, let somebody else interpret. A prophecy is better because prophecy edifies and builds the church. But as far as going into tongues, guys, like when I'm worshiping God, sometimes I go into tongues in church. But I'm not speaking for the church. I'm speaking for myself. I am worshiping God with my silk scarf and I'm going to tongues. I am worshiping my God during worship service in my seat, in my area, right? No one has to interpret that. I don't care to know what those words are. I know I'm speaking to my father. When I'm praying for somebody and I go into tongues for like a second or two seconds, I am doing spiritual warfare. The power comes through tongues. I know that because when I do tongues, more things break. I don't, I can't explain it, but guys, when I go into tongues, it's like fire falls. So yeah, and I, I'm not always privy to the interpretation of that. Sometimes I do get interpretations but not all the time. So I don't make it a habit to pray around or speak in tongues loud enough for everyone to hear kind of thing. But if I'm going to do my live, I'll absolutely start in tongues on this live because I know there are witches that watch my live and they try to do whatever they try to do. So my weapon is to pray in the spirit, blood of Jesus. I have to be on the fence. Um, yeah. Oh, hi. We are actually done. These are just questions. But listen, we read um, 2 Chronicles chapter 18, the story of Ahab and Jehoshaphat, and we talked about associations. Okay. Wow. Praise God. No, guys. One saved, always saved is a lie from the pits of hell. Because... Like I've told you, I could have, if I had died prior to the pandemic, I would not have gone to heaven. I was not carrying my cross every day. I was not doing the will of the Father. I was outside of the will of the Father. I had not submitted to his will. And I was definitely not doing what he told me to do. So that would not have um, got me into heaven, right? I was saved, but was I within the will of the Father? No, I was outside of his will. The Bible says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you're saved, praise God, you're saved, but you, there is work that you have to do. Yes, saved by grace, no, 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 I don't have to do any works. It's a lie from the pits of hell. Guys, I'm telling you, just like the demonic people sacrifice their children, sacrifice their marriages, sacrifice whatever they can to, to, to show that they are in alliance with the, de with the devil, we have to sacrifice something. Whichever kingdom you choose requires a sacrifice. A living sacrifice for God. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your bulls, your cattle, your oxen, your sheep. Your he doesn't want that. He wants you to be a living sacrifice for him. Transform your heart. Transform your mind daily by renewing. Do not conform to this word, but renew your mind. Transform your mind through his word. So once saved, always saved is not true. 
you can absolutely be saved today and go to hell tomorrow. You can go to hell for having anger issues. You can go to hell for having unforgiveness. You can go to, you can go to hell for, for being a liar, for being idolater, for being a coward. Let me read the scripture for you. Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter, oh, Holy Spirit, give it to me. Revelation chapter, where is it at? Let me tell you this, because this is going to debunk the once saved, always saved. Once you understand this scripture, you're not going to go with those people. I don't argue with people. It's not my job. But if you ask me, I'll tell you that that lie is going to land a lot of Christians into hell. Into hell. Um. I'm trying to find this particular scripture. Okay. Revelations 21 verse 8. We're going to close with this one, and then I'm going to go. Uh, I'll do another live, and we'll pray. I'm so sorry. I am. Um, my voice is getting hoarse, so that's like my, we're done for him. Revelation 21 verse 8 says, um, let me read this to you. And I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit. Open their minds, illuminate, because it said where the light is, darkness cannot be. And the light shone, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So let's read the scripture. Revelation 1 verse 8 says, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. My question to you is, why are people who are coward, or another, another um, translation would say fearful, be the first people that are mentioned? Why? When you are fearful, let's say I'm fearful. I will not be here doing my job doing what God told me to do because I'm fearful. Oh, they're going to attack me. All oh, the witches are on TikTok. Oh, guys, when you're fearful, you go straight to hell. The fearful, the unbelievers, it doesn't mention unbelievers first. It mentioned the fearful first. Fearful. Fearful. That's the one saved always saved crap it's not true if you're actually saved why are you having to use that to justify your wrongdoings why and what about being saved like i'm trying to understand where that even started from right that makes no sense it's a contract having christ jesus is a contractual commitment if you don't fulfill your part of the contractual commitment, you end up in hell. It's black and white. It is not gray. I promise you it is not gray. Which is why people who have unbelief in their hearts, doubt, unforgiveness will land you into hell. Anger, we talked about anger in my last life. Anger will land you into hell. We know plenty of people who are Christians who are angry, just angry, outbursts all the time, outbursts, outbursts, outbursts. That is not a character of God. God is holy. Around him there can be no sin. If you're always angry, you, anger leads you to unrighteousness. And if God is holy and requires us to be holy, how is your anger going to save you? So the one saved, always saved, is crap. It is a lie from the pits of hell. Guys, getting to heaven is not easy. If I'm the first person to tell you this, let me be the first to tell you, getting to heaven is not easy. It is not easy. Don't let them lie to you. Do not let these wolves in sheep's clothing lie to you. You absolutely land up in hell if you are a fearful person. You know why? You can't do your job. 
You can't do your assignment. You are a warrior, but you're terrified. You won't do spiritual warfare. You won't do offense. You get attacked and you start crying. Your family's falling apart. Your husband can't keep a job because they get he gets attacked. Your child gets attacked and you start cursing God. And then you're like, I'm going to curse God like Jake won't die. No, no, no. No. No, 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 no. You have the blood of Christ. You have the arm of God. You have the prophecy. You have the word. You have the principle. Learn the principles and go to war. When the enemy was thrown out of heaven, war broke out in heaven. He did not waltz out of heaven. No. He did not waltz out of heaven. War broke out. Angel Michael, Archangel Michael had to start. And an innumerable amount of angels went head to head with a third of the angels. And Lucifer. Do you guys think this thing is a joke? Guys, it is not a joke. It is not a joke. Your soul is not a joke. One saved, always saved is a lie that the devil crafted to manipulate people into hell. I know people that were Christians that are in hell right now. I'm telling you this because not, it is not easy to get into heaven. As a liar, you're going to go straight to hell. As an angry person, you're going to go straight to hell. That's why I did a teaching on anger. Do not be angry and keep anger. When the sun sets, you better have that figured out. You better figure that crap out. If you're angry at someone, figure it out before the sun sets. The Bible tells you that. Follow the Bible. Know what people say. If they say, one saved, always saved, and they can scripturally show you, scripturally show you this in the Bible, hallelujah, praise God, you're going to be fine. If they cannot show you this in scripture, do not abide by that. Go by what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says. The Bible says, Isaiah 119 says, If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. So guys, who's going to benefit when the shift changes, when God gives and showers people down with blessings? The willing and the obedient. Not everyone's going to benefit from this. Not everyone is going to benefit from the gifts that God gives. I don't want to be the one that lies to you. This kingdom requires you to be a fighter. That's why I come on here and I teach you guys what I've been through, what I fought through, how I did it, how to pray, how to fast. I'm not doing it because it's cute. <laughs> Y'all, I'm doing it because if you don't pray, if you don't know how to pray, there's people in the graves right now who are Christians who died 30 years prior to that time, 40 years prior to that time, 50 years prior to that time. Why? Through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Whoever crafted that lie, once saved, always saved. I'm sorry, guys. It's getting me so worked up because the Holy Spirit is so angry at that. It's a lie from the pits of hell. Christians are going to hell every day with that mindset. If your mind is not aligned with Christ, if you have hatred in your heart, anger in your heart, resentment in your heart, unforgiveness in your heart, you can't send your grandma, you can't send your mother, you can't send your father, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Figure it out. Take your hurt and your pain to God and ask God to fix it. He will fix it. But stop believing the lies of the enemy. He's using anyone to take you guys out. Including pastors. Who came up with that? Who came up with this? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Who came up with that? Who came up with that? Once saved, always saved. I personally know somebody from my family who is a preacher who is in hell. A preacher from my family is in hellfire right now. That pride, um, greed, unforgiveness. I know this. 
and God shows you a vision. Oh, look at that. She's, he's in hell. Wow. The Bible is true. Let every man be a liar and God be true. Learn from me. Guys, somebody in my family who preached the gospel of Christ Jesus is in hell right now. It is not easy to get to heaven. You follow what the word of God says. Forget people. Forget the liars. Forget the cowards. Forget them. You learn what the word of God says and you follow that to the T. Let every man be a liar and God be true. Philippians 2.12 tells us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear as in reverence of God. God cannot be mocked, you guys. God cannot be mocked. God is angry at people right now. Those people have lied to you guys. Pull down those strongholds. Fix it. You learn the truth. You hold on to the truth. That's it. You have to forgive. Forgiveness is non-negotiable. It is non-negotiable. I don't care what they did to you. God understands the pain. He understands the hurt. I understand the pain. And I understand the hurt. But you cannot be forgiven by God if you don't forgive. So how are you praying? How are you praying? You come before God every day dirty. 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 Excuse me. Let me read this scripture to you. My last scripture. Revelation 15, 16. No, 16, 15. I'm sorry. Look, I'll come as unexpectedly as a thief. Christ is saying this. Excuse me. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready. Your clothing is his righteousness, his ways, his righteousness, white as snow, pure. Not my pastor said, once saved, always saved, as you end up in hell. Why do you guys, why do you guys have so much trust in people? Like, how can you have so much trust in a human being? How are you basing your salvation and your soul on a person? And not God. You have a Bible. Read the Bible. Guys, please. Your soul depends on this. Your future depends on this. Your pastor might be heading to hell. That's all right. They choose their path. Everyone choose their path. Don't end up like your pastor. Talking about once saved, always saved. It is not true. Judas was close to God. Jesus Christ, he was close to him. He knew his schedule. Today's teaching is about associations. Judas was associated to God. Close associated, but he went to hell. How'd you explain that? How'd you explain that? You can be so close to God and still end up in hell. Because your heart, it says the devil entered his heart. The devil can only enter your heart if your heart is not in the right place. If you don't work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you don't test the mind and look at what is coming into your mind. Is this of God? No, I rebuke that thought. I take it captive and bring it on the submission of Christ. You have the manual. Tell, it tells you what to do, guys. It ha it's all in here. It's in here. Let me tell you what a doctrine is, okay? Because I think this will help you guys understand better. Let me tell you what a doctrine is. A doctrine is, oh, let me show you a, a picture. I, I drew it one time. A doctrine is um, like a tree, right? It's a belief system. But this belief system has to appear in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in the life of the apostles. I'm way above my time, but hallelujah, Jesus Christ. Like, you guys had a really good question, so I had to address that. Because this this is like so going to heaven or hell question. So my um, my prior commitment can wait. Let me find my picture. So a doctrine is a belief system. And it's grounded. The doctrines that we have to walk by as Christ believers have to be grounded in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the life 
of the apostles. That's when you know that something can be used. When you're confused about something, you need clarifications, you need understanding. Look in the Old Testament. Does this appear in the Old Testament? Once saved, always saved. No, okay. Does this appear in the New Testament? Once saved, always saved. No, okay. Does this appear in the life of the apostles? Once saved, always saved. No, okay then. I'm going to hell. It perturbs me when people are comfortable going to hell. Because your life in hell is eternity. You trust people so much that you take whatever they say. Like it's the word of God has been tested seven times. It has tested, been tested by fire like gold seven times. And it stood the test of time. Look at the word of God, okay? All right. This is my tree. You see? This is my tree, okay? You see this? I was checking to see whether fasting aligns with a true doctrine of Christ Jesus. Like, okay, we talk about fasting, fasting, fasting. Is that something that goes with Christ? So this, my understanding was, I need to understand whether fasting is, look at doctrine as a belief system. The roots of that, right? We need the roots. We are rooted in the word of God, right? Fasting. So fasting shows up in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 58. It shows up in Ezra uh, 32, I think. Ezra, they humbled themselves with fasting. It shows up a lot in the Old Testament. Esther, they fasted for three days, right? Old Testament, yes, fasting has been established in the Old Testament. Now let's go to the New Testament. Matthew 6, 16 talks about fasting. When you fast, do X, Y, and Z. Jesus talks about fasting. All right, so it appears in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, does it appear in the life of the apostles? Yes, Acts 13, 2. Fasting appears there. So now we can establish that fasting is a doctrine rooted in Christ, rooted on the Word. We're good. We're good. That's how you check. All right, you're saying once saved, always saved. Does it appear in all three places? No? Okay, I got to let it go. Do not just go just because you get emotionally attached to people. Your soul depends on it. Your child's soul depends on it. Okay? I hope that helps. I'm sorry. I had to. I don't want you guys going to hell because somebody taught you something crazy. It is not true. If you don't abide by the laws of the Lord, Old Testament was the laws. New Testament was the fulfillment of the law. Not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So if you know what's in the Old Testament, mm, read the Old Testament too, guys. It's pertinent. It's important. People won't have you swaying back and forth like a tree. like Not a tree. Kind of like a wave, actually. Yeah. Like, today you're in, tomorrow you're out, today you're saved, tomorrow you're not saved. No, that's dangerous. That is dangerous, guys. Um, all right, I have to go. I'm sorry if you have any more questions. Stop listening, guys. Associations matter. Exactly. Read the entire Bible. Oh, praise God. Secular music, guys, listen. Read the words that are being spoken in the secular music. Read the words that are being spoken because you're prophesying that over your life. If you listen to Beyonce and she's talking about wrecking her marriage or uh, infidelity, you are speaking, prophesying infidelity, adultery into your marriage. Y'all. Associations matter. That's why I had to make this teaching. Associations matter. I am associated with Christ Jesus. And when he tells me, leave that person alone, I'm going to leave you alone. I will not jeopardize my, my eternity for a song, for a movie, for a person, for a pastor, for an occasion. For a concert. 
y'all. I need you guys to understand how important it is that we we are vigilant and sober minded. Vigilant and sober minded. Your life depends on that. Your soul depends on that. Stop taking it lightly. If I take my last breath right now, right now, and I'm just gone, I know where I'm going with no shadow of a doubt. I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going with no shadow of a doubt? Now, if you have a weakness like secular music, you can kind of know I'm going to hell. Whether you love Jesus Christ or not, there's no forgiveness past the grave. There is none. Once you transition, once your spirit leaves the mortal body, you're done. Guys, I understand the temptations. I get it. I love beats. I love to dance. I love to dance. But I also know that dancing is worship. Who am I worshiping? God or the devil? There's no in-between. Okay? There's no in-between, guys. There's no in-between. It's time to wake up. Exactly. People are missing heaven for, oh, he's my boyfriend. Really? You And then you left, you died, you went to hell, and then your boyfriend finds Christ and makes it to heaven. Y'all, Paul says, let me not just preach to you that you make it to heaven and I don't make it. It's that serious. You can do all these things for God and still end up in hell just because you could not have self-control. Self-control. Okay? Guys, God bless you. On my next live, we'll pray for sure. Um, I have went way over my time, so my voice is like, ah. Uh. But I pray that God blesses you and strengthens you. And I'm praying for the spirit of self-control. Like, self-control. Like, when, when you get that nudge that what you're doing is wrong, move and don't do it. The Bible tells us that no temptation has come to man that is new to man. That means when you're tempted with secular music, Nelly has a new popping song that that's not new. Temptation is not new to man. That God gives a doorway. The door is open for you. Grace is open for you to escape that temptation. Take that door. Please take that door. Okay? Exactly. Stop compromising. Stop compromising. Because that could be the last time. That could be the last chance, y'all. That's 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 what hurts me for people that are like, oh, I'm having, I'm struggling with this. If you're struggling, ask God. Ask God to help you. Don't engage in it and then talk about how you're struggling. God is going to give you the strength to endure and the door to escape the temptation. But he's not going to do it for you. He's not going to, oh, let me take away secular music from the earth because Pram can't contain herself. That's not how it works. That's not how it works, guys. Okay? God bless you guys. We'll pray on the next live, okay? I apologize. My voice we went over time, but I know that this had to be um, answered. And if I did not answer your question, um, please, Unbreakable Shars, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. Just go ahead and message. Um, yeah, I don't want you guys hearing the Trump isn't going, oh my gosh, I'm in bed with my, somebody else's husband. No, no, don't, don't let that be you because you're going to be here for seven years of tribulation. No. Anyways, God loves you very much. I love you too. Bye.